Welcome everyone. Um, as people are getting started, just wanted to say hello and welcome everyone to the last day of Linux Plumbers Conference. Um, and before we get started, wanted to make a point of making sure to say thank you to our sponsors. And let me just make sure I'm presenter. Yeah, I'll take presenter. <laughs> and so, um, in particular, I would like to thank Facebook, who's our diamond sponsor this year. And we have also have IBM as our platinum. Arm and Microsoft are our gold sponsors. And Amazon, Netflix, and Red Hat are our silver. Um, our speaker gifts were provided by Calabra. And the t-shirt sponsor for this, this year is VMware. And there'll be information on how you can Get a t-shirt if you're in the first 200, there's only 200 of them, um, in the uh, closing keynote after this session. And of course, we want to make sure we thank um, our the Linux Foundation and the Conference Services team there that's helped us pull this all together. Um, I think most of you are familiar with this, uh, the, uh, the anti-harassment policy. I think it comes down to be nice to each other and be respectful. And I don't think I'm, there'll be too many issues in that direction with this group. Um, please keep your microphones and cameras muted when you're not participating actively, but when you do want to participate actively, please do turn them on. It does make it much more interesting for everyone. Um, questions are welcome. Uh, there's a chat that is um, accessible and the link to it is in the shared notes um, as well as it being integrated. So you can either follow along in the shared notes or in the in the chat in a separate window or just you know follow the chat stream in this and the um, committee for this year's plumbers is um david woodhouse elena myself james bonley christian bonner jonathan corbett Gil Arty, and steve rostet if you've got any questions or concerns um please feel free to reach out to one of us and with that i will switch over no we're not on a break yet <laughs> We are actually about to start um, the event. So let me just bring up the intro uh, for our MoneyConf. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us here today. And what we're trying to do here with this one, this MoneyConf is it came about as a result of, um, there's you now, good, excellent. <laughs> it came about as a result of a boff that Shu and I held last year. Uh, when we were trying to understand what we really needed to do to improve diversity here at Plumbers. And um, there was a lot of really great input um, and we've been sort of trying some of the ideas over this last year. Um, and we've been sort of looking at, okay, our, we've got a trend line that's sort of at the uh, stage of, you know, slowly increasing <laughs> and trying to figure out what we can do to sort of, you know, really change the trajectory on that and want to make sure that we, you know, we have an inclusive space. So there's been a lot of work going on and you'll be seeing some of that later today. But what we've got right now is, um, we also had our keynote from Mad Dog and he had some good suggestions as to pass forward from his perspective of what he sees. And so um, wanted to make sure that, you know, to highlight that, you know, telling people they've done good, um, but keep scratching the itch as a hobbyist. And that's sort of one of the things we're seeing less of it to some degree, or at least that's what it feels like. Um, and then becoming the mentoring and newbies. And so, so these are some of the themes that we've been, we'll be talking about. Um, the schedule is up on, on the plumber site and all of the presentations are available for download. Um, the next topic up is gonna be Jessica. And she'll be talking a bit about uh, the work that's been going on for surveying um, open source for diversity that the LF research team has been working on. And then Dr. Vandana Singh is going to be talking about the woman of open source software and some of the insights that she's been getting from her research. And then Bianca is going to be um, giving us a, a preliminary snapshot of the results from the survey that's been going on and that she was talking about in her talk on Tuesday. We will then have a break um, until the top of the hour, till um, nine o'clock. So um, between 20, you know, 10 or 20 minutes, depending on you know, if things overrun or not, but 
will reset so everyone can join us again at the top of the hour. After which, uh, Dr. Anita Sarna is going to be talking about mentoring at scale. And um, then Dr. Don German will be talking about some of the work we've been looking at with mining the kernel and um, the evidence in the kernel in terms of what the trends are for diversity. And then we'll be joined towards the end of the afternoon day by Angela Brown. Um, Angela runs the events for the Linux Foundation and she's got some of the stats that she's been seeing to share. And then we'll sort of have a wrap up session uh, for the last 20 minutes or so and try to come up with some concrete actions we can take um, for the next uh, year. Oops, go back. So just a few logistics. Um, there's a shared notes on this, uh, which is where we're going to be recording, you know, the outcomes from the session and the comment, you know, the key comments that we pick up. Everyone is welcome to help us type in there. It is not um, restricted to just one person or anything else. It's a shared document. And if someone gets something wrong, feel free to go in and correct them. And if you are using the shared notes and working there, um, the suggestion is to um, use the chat in a separate window so you don't have to switch back and forth. Um, and this is where the shared notes look like, right? Um, and when you want to interact, uh, I'd like, you know, as much as we can make this one, you know, interactive and ongoing, um, just turn your cameras on and uh, start talking when you're acknowledged and start asking your questions. So the more we can make this one interactive, I think the more fun it's going to be for everyone. And then just a reminder is as we, as you sort of are listening to the session, start thinking about your own mind, you know, one of our goals is to increase the pool of diverse contributors. Um, you know, we want to help increase the pool of maintainers um, so we can help them with the um, quality and frustration. So we need to get, you know, we need to basically build the pipeline into the maintainers um, and have more diversity, I think, there. And we also obviously want to have new contributors coming in and help retain them over time. So, you know, at the end of this workshop and the wrap up, we'd like to try to see if we can figure out some next steps and where we can, you know, strategically try to work um, and then we'll try to you know track it and checkpoint next year Shua, any more any comments you want to add to that no uh thank you good um so the one thing uh, i really liked from uh listening to john mark dr hall is that uh building uh teams is as important as building code and uh, i admit that for me Building code is a lot more fun. Um, however, uh, we do want to take the time because we're all getting older. We need to uh, spend time building the team as well so that we continue to uh, to make uh, open source and Linux successful or continue to be sustainable for the yeah. future. Fair, fair enough indeed. Okay, well, I'm gonna turn it over then now to our first speaker, I'll just, um, Jessica. And bring up her presentation. Oops, sorry. We didn't reset it. Oh. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah, you're getting, getting, getting <laughs> advanced. And here, and I'll drop, and I'll basically turn my camera off and turn the presentations over to you right now. Okay, just a second. Let me find you here. Excellent. Okay, All right. you should be a presenter now. Great, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, and thank you to the Linux Plumbers Conference for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm Jessica Grootman. Um, I am calling in bright and early from the Bay Area in California. So good morning or good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, and I'm excited to present to you um, some key themes and preliminary results of new research on diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source uh, as, as run by the Linux Foundation. Um, now, I am an industry analyst and founding partner with Kaleido Insights. We're a research and advisory firm, and we look at several different emerging technologies with a real focus on some of the kind of thematic or sociological impacts of these technologies. And boy, in the last mm, three years or so, the, the number, the amount of work and focus in diversity, equity, and inclusion from our clients on the adopter side, on the technology supplier side, and even now in, in open source communities, 
uh, has just been through the roof. So very uh, encouraging and exciting to, to join on this Linux Foundation research uh, as part of this tracking of, of the trend of how this has unique implications when it comes to the tech industry. So before I get into some of these themes, I want to speak a little bit about the research itself. Um, this is an ongoing effort. I want to emphasize that the research is still underway uh, and, and what you're seeing today is a kind of preliminary take on the analysis. We have been working hard to, to crunch the data uh, as much as possible. This, the survey was fielded in July. Uh, the, the total sample of respondents is 2,350, which if I understand correctly is one of the higher sample sizes uh, for these kinds of reports uh, with a margin of error of plus or minus 3.1 with a 90% confidence or 2.6 with a 95% confidence. Um, now we're defining diversity within open source as a composition of any number of the following possibilities or groups, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, social class, physical ability or attributes, religious beliefs, value systems, origins, uh, political affiliation, and so on. Um, so trying to take a kind of wide uh, angle view of what we're talking about when we talk about exclusion and when we talk about backgrounds. Um, my role in particular on this project, uh, outside of just writing the report and, and supporting the analysis, has been conducting qualitative interviews. Uh, which have been underway for the last two months. We've completed at this point 16 interviews across 18 different people um, and really work to get perspectives from across the open source ecosystem. So not just contributors and maintainers, but also leaders of, of open source project offices, um, of diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders across all over the world, across different kinds of demographic backgrounds. Um, and it has been quite eye-opening, so I'm excited to, to share some of the findings with you. Okay, so without further ado, here is just a brief overview uh, of our sample and perhaps representation as it looks in open source. 82% um, uh, uh, of those respondents were men compared to 14% women, 4% uh, non-binary or another identifying gender. Uh, we asked of different racial backgrounds, but only in North America. Um, and then we also looked at uh, where are you coming from? What kind of geographic blend uh, is in the community? And we actually, these are, these are categories, Europe, North America, APAC. We asked specific countries uh, and regions as well. So what are we seeing so far? Um, I would say the first big theme is that open source diversity reflects the, glo the growing global adoption of open source by virtually every metric open source has been exploding in recent years. And unlike some of the kind of solely, you know, American or, or Western notions of, uh, you know, just gender or just racial inclusion, um, what we're seeing is that the barriers to inclusion actually vary really widely. And um, I'll share with you in a moment one of the kind of um, findings that came out of this that, that I think exemplifies that, that well, uh, something that's often overlooked when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Uh, the second big theme is that how do we think about a sense of welcomeness and culture of inclusion in open source? Well, the answer is it depends. And we'll look at some, some findings from the data that suggest it's actually in pretty good shape, but also some variations when we dig into some of the segmentation. Uh, third, to toxic experiences generally are relatively infrequent. Uh, we hear about them a lot. They have a kind of large microphone. Um, but when you look at, okay, well, what sorts of exclusionary behaviors are happening and who are they impacting, we see a disproportionate impact for sure. Um, and finally, the, the overarching, I would say, refrain of a lot of the interviews that we've done is that, well, you know, we've come a long way in recent um, years, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, and so I'll talk through a couple of the initiatives, uh, including conferences like this, uh, or micro conferences like this that we're seeing as well as some of the opportunities to expand those efforts. All right, uh, open source diversity reflects growing adoption, as I said, across the globe. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, not just racial and gender, but, but disability, age, education, employment, caregiving, access to reliable technology, access to mobile versus laptop, all of these actually comprise a sense of inclusion uh, and the ability to reliably contribute to establish one's profile, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I, I threw on the, the slide here um, a chart looking at is open source taught as part of your school's curriculum? Because one of the big findings here is 
what we might call the contributor life cycle or how early in one's life is one exposed to open source tools, technologies, the community, the culture, so on and so forth. And even in the United States and Europe, uh, it's fairly low. This is a huge opportunity, speaking of ecosystem roles, uh, to really build this out. And so you can see actually that these numbers vary across the world, uh, as do the numbers of, well, we're not sure if open source actually exists as part of a school's curriculum. Um, broadly speaking today though, especially among women um, and, and LGBTQ folks and people with disabilities, the level of education is actually higher. You can see 74% uh, of respondents had a bachelor's degree or higher. Now, another finding uh, that really stood out to us um, was this idea of time being a determinant. We often hear about access or maybe exposure or education or income, uh, but time itself being one of the primary determinants for open source participation. How much time am I willing to spend on something that's unpaid? Uh, a resounding finding was, you know, do I do I understand in my own personal context uh, economic value for participating? And again, especially for those kind of newer in their careers. Um, am I, do I have the opportunity to actually spend time networking or the is my contribution time really the only time that I have? Time zones themselves uh, and how we think about promotion and meeting and community building, particularly in these uh, virtual times that we're living in. Um, time to professional development tied to that unpaid piece. Do I see job opportunities as part of my time investment here or is that not really part of the equation? In several countries, uh, folks that we spoke to said, you know, there's just not really that much employer uh, embrace or adoption of open source that blesses employees to spend their time on this. How much time does it take to onboarding? Uh, onboarding is a huge theme that we'll talk about more, but the, the, the question of time in onboarding. How much discretionary time do I have to spend outside of my day job or outside of my child care, you know, obligations or whatever, the other things in my life? Uh, how much discretionary time do I have? And then we heard just kind of this general, uh, I, I like to say during the pandemic time was sort of flattened, but, you know, in, in all cases, a fatigue, a sense of, uh, you know, disassociation with time and how this has impacted people's ability to pursue new endeavors or to, to devote time to mentorship and so forth. The big theme around time that we found. Now, moving on to number two, what does the culture of diversity, equity, inclusion feel like in open source? Do people feel welcome uh, in open source communities? Well, we found that of all survey respondents, 82% feel welcome in open source. This is quite encouraging. However, when we look into the data, demographic segmentations show some varied uh, sentiments. What you see in the chart on the left is a, is a breakdown of some of these segmentations by various uh, you know, group demographics or categorizations. Uh, the percentage who agree with the statement, I feel welcome in open source. And the orange bar there is that total sample, that's the 80%. And so you can see there's some variation, uh, particularly for folks with disabilities, for women and, and other genders, um, as well as for uh, black contributors. And again, particularly in North America, because that's where we ask race. Now, when we dug into that 18%, so if 82% agree, 18% did not agree that they feel welcome in open source, we saw an overwhelmingly disproportionate impact uh, on people with disabilities. 38% of those that disagreed uh, were people with, who identified as having disability. And that's compared to just 15% that felt welcome. In other words, those that feel welcome, only 15% were uh, people that identified with a disability. Uh, same trends and when it comes to transgender, 16% of those that disagreed were transgender compared to just 3% in the welcome category, feelings of welcome. 25% of those that disagreed uh, were black in North America compared to just 7%. Uh, and in general, there are several uh, questions on the survey, we're still digging into this, uh, that show that North Americans in particular uh, are, are quite sensitive to these issues, um, that they are quite sensitive to feelings of, you know, unequal background, unequal opportunities for participation, for decision making uh, in backgrounds. And so, again, across several different questions, not just North Americans, but, but I would say disproportionately so, disabled people, uh, folks of different genders and different racial groups were, were less likely to agree on welcomeness. We're less likely to agree that people from different backgrounds uh, have equal opportunities to participate in open source, as well as to be part of decision-making processes in open source. 
Um, the third finding really is, yes, you know, we hear a lot about you know, horrible circumstances around doxing and violence and stalking, but in truth, these kind of physical threats um, are, are, are fairly infrequent across, across the wider population. You can see over here on the right, the, the two blue colors are occasionally or frequently. Um, now, when it comes to some of these other maybe more um, implicit or ambiguous behaviors of kind of language or interlocution uh, or just perceived stereotyping, this is a little bit more common. Uh, in fact, you can see here that 17% are experiencing some kind of stereotyping based on perceived demographics on a occasional or frequent basis. Now, again, when we zoom in a little bit closer and look at the segments of those uh, that don't feel welcome. And by the way, the same is true for uh, folks of different racial backgrounds, of different genders, um, and, and disabled people. Uh, these numbers are dramatically different. So here I'm taking uh, the top four boxes of, of that chart I just showed you. Have you ever experienced any of these behaviors directed at you? And here we see the, the full sample. This is a replica of the chart that you just saw. So 36% are experiencing a lack of contribution. 19% uh, are experiencing, again, on occasional or, or frequent basis, conflict or interpersonal tension. But check out these numbers here on the right. And this is of those who are not feeling welcome, which, as I just mentioned, has that kind of disproportionate um, demographic of, of disabled, uh, different genders and racial. 80% uh, are experiencing a lack of response or rejection or contribution to their contributions on an occasional or frequent basis. Um, you know, something like written or spoken language that makes people feel unwelcome, 70% experiencing this regularly compared to just 18%. Uh, so some really jump out numbers. And this is, again, true uh, as we dig into each question, if you look at just uh, the written and spoken language across different subsets of demographics. The research, uh, the analysis is underway, but this is definitely a pretty stark difference here uh, that well, when it comes to people that you know feel that don't feel welcome, they have pretty good reasons because you can see these are these are these are some bad experiences on a, on an occasional or frequent basis. Um, these behaviors can have a wide impact. It's not just a feeling of well, you know, I feel discriminated against because of my gender or because of my race or because of my ability. Uh, we are also finding. Uh, and the many, many uh, impassioned open source, I'm sorry, open-ended, um, you know, responses, that this has an impact for people who are new to the community, um, for people of different class levels, for people who may not speak English very well. It can be even more intimidating. Um, they're already trying to simply participate, uh, albeit with, with, you know, uh, language skills that that aren't necessarily uh, in line with everything being in English all the time, especially when it comes to networking and community building. Um, this is an issue that is, you know, something like access to reliable connectivity only exacerbates um, a sense of inclusion and access. And again, having these kinds of exclusionary behaviors underway while people are participating um, only adds to that challenge. Um, same again with geographical. If I'm signing on very late at night or very early in the morning, depending on where I live, um, who needs it? <laughs> it's kind of a theme that we heard. Uh, you can see in this comment down here. I have to wonder if the work I put in offering feedback is going to get an immediate dismissal. It makes me way less likely to contribute. Uh, we also heard um, not just political differences, but geopolitical, uh, particularly folks in Asia reporting that they're sensing you know, some of the macro uh, geopolitical tensions between you know, the United States and China and that making its way into some of these per perceptions of stereotypes or lack of, lack of response and so forth. Um, we found that 34% of respondents overall disagree that people from different backgrounds have equal opportunities to participate. And I just want to underscore this because, again, when we think about backgrounds, perhaps through the kind of American or, or North American lens, uh, we tend to talk specifically about uh, gender, race, or class. Uh, but, the, you know, the survey sort of reinforces several times over that this has several more definitions we talk about backgrounds and how that can impact access and inclusion. Uh, fourth, and hopefully we'll end on a higher note here, um, we've come a long way. As I said, this was a resounding uh, refrain from, from folks that we interviewed. Of, you know, things have really changed. Initiatives that would have been unheard of a decade ago have become table stakes, have become baked in to some degree, actually parts of templates uh, for, for, for people who want to start new projects every day. 
um, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics from uh, from chaos and the community health um, program has been uh, instrumental, I think, for really trying not just to introduce metrics and test them out and put them into real world scenarios, but for baking in the mindset um, that that you know we hear about inclusion by design or inclusive design, but so much of that is also about how we develop metrics from the outset as a way of designing the project and designing the community, designing metrics for governance, so on and so forth. And so that's just one example of an area that I think has been uh, particularly powerful, as well as the contributor covenant. I mean, really all of these came up in almost every interview that we had. Um, now, I'm, I'm only giving you a teaser today. As I mentioned, we're still fairly early on in this process uh, of, of full analysis and reporting. Um, but publication of this report is slated for December 2021. I encourage you all to download the final report uh, where we really focus in on not just the dynamics of various demographics and their lived experiences, what they've witnessed, um, you know, how this varies by geography and so forth, but the efficacy of current solutions. That's been a huge focus of this research to really tease out what's working. Um, why is it working? Where are the limitations as well as okay, what solution areas should be in place to fill those gaps? Uh, so a, a big part of the report will certainly feature um, not just current initiatives and how uh, kind of effective they are, but recommendations to expand those, those solutions and particularly across the broader ecosystem. So zooming out a little bit, um, you know, the increasingly global nature of open source expands the barriers, but also opportunities for inclusion. Uh, in the report, we're featuring a handful of different opportunities that maybe are non-obvious when we think about some of those current solutions, but are starting to really gain traction, especially as they relate to the dynamics in local areas. Um, perhaps you, we could call it, you know, the solutions uh, that work in New Orleans uh, are going to be a little bit different than the solutions that are working in Nigeria because those, those localized contexts have different dynamics. They have different areas in which people care and, want, and are kind of incentivized to participate. Um, so there are some opportunities, not just unique uh, barriers as well. Yes, cultures vary by community. Different communities set their own standards. More and more, there's been you know, standardization of things like codes of conduct and, and inclusive naming initiatives and so forth. Um, but we can see really over and over, and I would say we are still processing the data, as I said, several groups are disproportionately impacted by these exclusionary behaviors. And we are amidst a slow shift uh, from what we might call passive exclusion to proactive inclusion. Another big theme from our interviews and focusing on the solution side is this is not going to happen, you know, while we're asleep. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight um, and it takes efforts. It takes resources. It takes time. It takes, um, you know, a, a dedicated active measure to, to, to really implement these steps and to uphold them. Um, but when we talk about structural change, we're talking about a village. It takes a village. Um, in other words, part of the changes to come require broader ecosystem adoption. And so we're looking at what is the role not just of maintainers and contributors and foundations and open source hubs, but also of corporates, um, also of you know investors, of uh, international organizations, of universities and local communities. Uh, all of these different constituents play a role. Um, and so I hope to have a little bit of time to discuss and maybe clarify if needed uh, any of the findings. And I hope that this was valuable to kick off the day. Thank you very much. I'm Jessica Gutman. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I see Dan's raised his hand. Um, do you want to come unmute, Dan? Feel free to join. Or type something in the chat, whichever you prefer. Okay. Um, hi. Um, hi, Dan. Did, did you did you um, include like which projects uh, people were contributing to when they were answering the survey? Just to, like, is there any data on which projects are doing are having a better time with this topic versus ones that aren't? And and like for opportunities for cross sharing between projects, like, hey, this works for us. This really makes people feel included. Yeah, that's um, a great question. Um, from a survey perspective, I believe there was a question around which communities you participate in um, or, you know, GitHub uh, or, or other communities like that. 
I don't think that we have specific projects. Um, a few came up uh, as, as examples in the interviews, but with regards to the survey itself, uh, it did not go that deep. Um, but certainly, and I will say one thing that we heard from the kind of uh, open source project office uh, perspective was this need for best practice sharing across different communities, um, regardless of kind of technology area or application or whatever, uh, is crucial. And that's been a big focus for their role um, as kind of, you know, influence and procurement uh, muscle from the corporate side of how do we take what we're learning internally and also sort of uh, pollinate it back out into the into the open source ecosystem. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? I was thinking, else answering, asking, I was going to also ask, um, has uh -huh. Linux Foundation thought of, thought about training, trainings for maintainers around this topic? Like, um, ma maintainers usually, do, they, they get their positions by just starting projects or, or, or being heavy contributors, but they're not, I don't, maybe you don't have backgrounds on how to do, how to do people development. Is that, um, that's something the Linux Foundation is looking at? Um, I wouldn't be the one to answer that. I, I certainly <laughs> encourage any other folks who might have that background to chime in. Sure. Um, I have not, I'm, I, I know there's a lot of interest. I don't know if anyone's actually started designing a course, so I've taken a note and that's probably maybe something we should be, we'll, we'll, we'll tag as an idea for the end, uh, for the next steps and sort of take that back. Cause I think I see the need to, when you speak it like that, when you sort of phrase it like that. <laughs> In the sense that yeah, people are being sort of dropped in. It's sort of like the equivalent of going from being a developer to a manager. And if you don't have management training, it gets sort of interesting, <laughs> to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. um, so what I am looking to do is uh, next year I'm looking to do a mentorship a maintainer uh, tips type series in the LF Live mentorship program. Um, we have covered a lot of uh, new developer focused. Uh, topics this year uh, since we started last year so my goal is to get more of that content in I'll be reaching out to at least Linux kernel maintainers that's where I, I tend to focus this program I'm focusing this program on but we do have the need for looking at it more uh, open source wide and looking at other projects as well uh, sure uh, Kay, I don't know if uh, I don't think the presenter sees this but uh, Anita has has her yeah. hand raised so it, no. you may have to let people know that the hand is someone's hands raised. Yeah, um, good point. Anyhow, so yeah, Anita, thanks, Steve. Um, Anita, feel free to turn your camera on. Yeah, yeah I, I'm one. trying to. It's it's doing all kinds of weird stuff. Maybe you <laughs> you figure it out. <clears throat> Sorry, it's still too early for me. I haven't had my jug of tea yet. Hi, Jess. Nice, Hi, nice survey. <laughs> uh, one of the questions I had, and you know, uh, we had discussed it a little bit, but uh, your insight on the gender diversity and race diversity in your survey being so much higher than past surveys have been. Do you have any any insight on why this might be what you're seeing here? Um, no, I, I am I'm not sure. I know that, I mean, certainly broadly speaking, there's been, you know, more and more awareness and interest in the area, but um, as compared to past surveys, I don't know. Okay. Maybe it's because you were able to reach a really wide, wide uh, segment of, of people. I think this is the largest survey I have ever come across, like 2000. Um, survey respondents, right? Something like that. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to say the wrong thing, but I think it is one of the largest samples. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's certainly <laughs> on the higher end of of, of samples um, from from Linux Foundation surveys in, in this area. Um, going back to the maintainer question, it struck me while you all were talking. Um, we did hear of of training specifically for maintainers. Um, to not just for mentorship and sort of best practices there, but to actually involve them in some of the other changes. So for example, there's a community called SUPA base, uh, S-U-P-A base, 
which uh, is involving maintainers in identifying first issues, first issues being one of the you know, best practices for making the onboarding process easier, for you know, making uh, the learning curve a little bit less for newcomers, and to actually involve maintainers, just one small example uh, of identifying those issues and, and helping them um, you know, have a kind of feedback loop in what sorts of on onboarding uh, improvements can be made. Um, other questions? Okay. Anyone else? And I will jump in uh, again instead of like, <laughs> like, like I say, it's supposed to be as informal as we can, you know. Yeah, this start share on share is kind of bizarre in this stuff. One of the things that struck me, uh, Jess, and from other uh, research I have been doing is. Um, when you were talking about training, I think Shua mentioned it, it might also be useful to have uh, training for like how to do good code reviews and mm -hmm. especially code reviews that are, you know, explaining and helping build skills for the juniors or the mentees because then it kind of, it's, it's a short amount, that's one of the talk, that's the talk I'm going to uh, focus on. It's like you can give not too much time and effort, but if you do a good job in um, mentoring through the code reviews, it can be much more hopefully scalable to get more people up. Yeah, um, that's an excellent point. We interviewed Kelly Blinko um, in, from uh, New Zealand, who is focused on this particular area of what what constitutes good feedback. Um, and she has a word for it that is escaping me now, but you know, feedback that is a few words that doesn't actually address the issue or worse <laughs> is exclusionary in tone. Uh, mm. versus feedback that really actually does educate and teach and gives context and so forth as being a kind of function for inclusion. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions I can answer? Yeah. We've got about a minute left in this section, then we'll move on to the next. Oh, that's really good. Thank you for sharing that initial, you know, snapshot of the DIA. As it's yeah, emerging. stay tuned for much more. Uh, it's exciting. <laughs> It's really, uh, it, it's been great to work on. And thanks uh, especially to Hillary Carter, who is, is running the, the research of this from the Linux Foundation side. Um, so thanks everyone. Uh, feel free to ask questions as the day goes on. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to our next, let's queue up our next speakers to talk. Um, and that is going to be Vandana. So let me go and switch presentations and then give you presenter. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I've got that up. And you're up. Okay, good. <laughs> then I'll give you the presenter. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the presenter thing, Matan, then. And if you could just wait maybe a minute or two more, well, we can just chat for a second and give it to you and then you can start yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. That was really, really good, Jessica. Thank you for the snapshot. And um, I, I'm very, you know, happy to see that and also following that because I think some of the things you mentioned, Jessica mentioned there, I think I'll touch on them as well. Um, and also, you know, that's more percentages and numbers and i'll talk more about experiences of you know talking to women in open source so um very good to see also the 14 percent that you know that was your number of women respondents i think that's that's great too and you know how many participated and also how many are there so that's i think those are all good uh good numbers <laughs> yeah okay and I will go off camera and leave it up to you. And you should hopefully be able to move things now. Yes, okay. Well, hello everyone, good morning. Um, I, would, um, I will be talking about some of my research that is about women in open source software. Um, my name is Vandana Singh and I'm an associate professor at University of Tennessee. Um, I've been doing research in open source software for about 20 years. Um, today I will be talking about my research uh, that focuses on women of open source software for a few years, about five years now I've been 
um, interested in diversity and inclusion issues in open source software and have done several projects on it. So the way I want to use the time we have today together is I will give you a quick overview of the different projects that I'm working on um, in open source, diversity in open source specifically. And then I want to uh, kind of delve deeper into a study, some results from a study in which I ask the questions of, you know, why women join OSS, because a lot of times you hear um, you know, uh, this perception that maybe women don't want to join or maybe the toxic behavior stories are too loud or, you know, why would women want to join? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, why they stay once they join, what makes them stay? Because I think retention, as Jessica also touched on, retention is a huge thing. So I will talk a little bit about that as well. Why, when I asked women why they stay, then what were their reasons for staying there? Um, and then also, and uh, you know, talk a little bit about what their experiences are of contributing to OSS. So for me, the most interesting aspect of the previous uh, presentation was that 18%. And then within that 18%, it's an 80%, you know, toxicity, or um, I think even the categorization, you could say most of them were, you know, even if it's that they encounter these things rarely, I don't think it's an it's a never, right? So for me, those three categories are together frequently, occasionally, rarely, because even rarely are facing it. Um, and then of course the never is where where we want to be. Um, so we'll I'll talk a little bit about what the experiences of the women that I interviewed and surveyed, what their experiences were. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what they suggested and also what across the research and you know what I have found out about what are the some of the strategies to welcome women to OSS for retention and recruiting. Um, and I would like to say, you know, if at any point of time you have any question, any comments, anything you want to ask, don't feel, um, you know, that um, you have to raise the hand or you have to, you know, you can interrupt me. It's okay. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer which I see a little hand, but I think that might be my cursor. So is there a way for me to know if there's a hand raised? Well, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, so with that, I will um, get started with uh, some of the, just a quick snapshot of the different types of projects that I've worked on um, in diversity and open source software. Um, one of the things that I've worked on with is with surveys and interviews with women. And in that I asked about, you know, what their motivations are, why they join, why they, um, how they stay there, what are their, when they first time joined the community, what was their experience when they stayed, what was their experience, uh, what would they advise newcomers to do? Um, you know, so those type of questions I asked. And then another one uh, project that I worked on was this, this concept of safe spaces. Um, so I think safe spaces are very important for women um, to and again, you know, it can be women, it can be other groups as well. But in my case, I studied women. Uh, and so I looked at safe spaces for women. Safe spaces were the spaces, I termed them safe spaces because these were sp spaces where women were comfortable in sharing what they were going through. And uh, these places became how women support each other, how they gather to, you know, discuss how to do advocacy, how to move forward in, in, in problems that they're facing. They also share, you know, mentorship, to networking, different types of things that they're able to support each other with um, in, in women's forums in open source software. Um, another project that I worked was about, so one of the things that I found out when I talked to women about uh, what they think communities can do uh, was that having an enforceable customized code of conduct. So I, you know, I looked deeper into it. I looked at how many communities have uh, codes of conduct and what kind of um, diversity aspects do these codes of conduct actually cover? You know, how many actually say it's, you know, what, what are the generic template things they're using or what are the customized things they're using? Uh, and then I looked at uh, women's forums to see how they were discussing these codes of conduct and what, how they used um, them to either 
enforce good behavior or change or create advocacy or support each other. So that is, you know, one of the projects that I worked with about, about codes of conduct. Uh, and then currently I'm working on a project which is about that 18% again, the discrimination, host hostility and misogyny in OSS, which again, you know, it might not be the most frequent thing that is happening, but the impact of it is severe. So I think it is very important to be aware of it and to do this type of work. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think it's important um, to study this as well. Um, and another thing, I'm, you know, as I'm working, of course, I, as soon as I start talking to women uh, right away, you see that, you know, we like to say women, but it's not a homogenous group. So intersectionality is very important to understand and to pay attention to is, you know, there are different factors um, along with gender um, that make it even more complicated um, of what their experiences are and how um, the success is achieved for them. Um, and then, of course, you know, one of the things that I would like to say as I start talking about this is that um, I am talking from the point of view of respondents for a survey or interviews, um, and Jessica was doing the same thing. And so what we see is a lot of the information that we have is from people who are here, who are participating and continuing to participate. So in a way, their you know, success story, or uh, at least at the point they respond to survey, they're, you know, they're there. At least retention is happening. Uh, but there's a lot of people, people who leave. So one of the data points I was looking at from NCVIT was uh, that 56% of women in technology quit. Um, and you know, change career or leave or whatever the reason might be for it. So that's a, that's a quite a high number. And we already know that the number in technology is so low. So out of the ones like 23% or so that join, more than half might quit. That is uh, something that we need to understand. So that I'm very interested in is, you know, what makes people, women leave? And, you know, what are the things that are impacting them to just you know, not continue. Um, so that's another project I'm working on. If you're interested in any of these projects and knowing more about it, my uh, URL for my website is there where I have papers that are published on these things. And also I update that for, you know, the projects that I'm working on. Um, so with that, I will go specifically into one particular study um, that I want to talk about today. And this is um, results from a survey of women in open source software. Um, and I had uh, 58 women respondents, which I who I talked to. Um, the respondents were from different countries, as you can see. Um, one of the things that I would like to point out is in the last column where it says prefer not to answer. Um, this was, you know, one of the survey respondents um, got in touch with me, emailed me and said that you're asking me which product I'm working on and you're asking me which country I'm from. And just the combination of those two factors is it will be very easy for anybody to find out who I am. And so your survey is not anonymous. Um, you can, you know, you cannot promise anonymity to me, uh, which, you know, of course, two things from that, that. First of all, of course, I have to say that it's not anonymous, but confidential and that I can promise confidentiality. I cannot promise anonymity. But also there's the fact that for completing a survey, um, you know, she was uh, she was either scared or she, she wasn't, you know, that that was a problem that that she would be identified for contributing her intellectual you know, uh, energy, her time and uh, contributing to something and then to be scared to be associated with it. I think that 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 really hit me hard and made me like really work more uh, on on these things, you know. So uh, that's what this is. It is a result from uh, I, you know, from the survey, uh, I the survey and the interviews were from um, eight different um, versus projects, the women focused mailing lists there and the questions were open ended questions and closed ended questions and um, <clears throat> interviews, qualitative interviews. So what I would like to do then is instead of uh, <clears throat> present, you know, it's 58 um, respondents, which I think is, is quite high, but still um, I think the, you know, instead of talking percentages of that, um, I would like to share in their own words, what are some of the things that they had said, which um, are kind of, you know, things that were repeated enough times to make a category of its own. 
Um, so I'll, I'll share some of those things, so the, you know, the, for the question of why do women join open source software? And the reason to ask this question was, of course, one of the things is, you know, that maybe women are not interested, but also I remember early on <clears throat> when I was doing my, you know, dissertation work, PhD um, work, and I was doing all literature reviews in open source software. There were early 2000s, there were a lot of studies about motivations for open source software. You know, who are these people? Who, um, and of course the sample was overwhelmingly male. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to see if it is similar, if it is different, uh, you know, are there things there that could be different? Um, so that's why I asked why women join um, open source software, the women who I talked with. Um, and there were, quite a lot of overlap in what we saw in, you know, what, what we used to see in the studies that were about motivations of men uh, or contributors, um, the desire to fix a problem, a personal problem that they're facing. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I thought was very useful also based on seeing uh, how um, the forums work as mentorship and networking opportunities is that if they were encouraged by a boss or a mentor or a professor to contribute. So I think these are the points that we we were also talking about earlier in terms of education you know if we start um, integrating these things into education um, with uh, younger students or at, at university level students and have um, events like hackathons which are also another way in which there was a positive uh, experience the first experience associated with participating in a hackathon was good there was somebody to, who helped them through how, who helped them participate who told them about what this is all about and how to <clears throat> participate in it um, and then also <clears throat> some women um, said that they uh, started with um, OSS as a full-time job so you know the paid and unpaid thing so in in education setting in higher education if we can include it or uh, in K through 12 as well um, then we can think about you know events in which we can um, welcome create a welcoming environment uh, but then also it's not just limited to that in first-time jobs also people start contributing um, Another reason, one of the ones which I think is, you know, similar to what we would see in um, surveys about males is to learn just about the entire process, to learn how to support software development process, uh, an opportunity to work and learn from experienced programmers to be mentored, um, and then success of specific projects. So if they, uh, you know, liked a particular project, if certain projects appealed to them, then they chose to participate in that. Um, and then, of course, you know, very core is also this idea of beliefs in the ideals of uh, open source software. So I believe in the philosophy of open source software and I contribute to it and I want to contribute to it. And this element of reciprocity, again, something that we have seen earlier um, with <clears throat> wider um, and respondents is that because I use an open source software, I want to be able to give back. I want to reciprocate. So the element of reciprocity uh, was also something that they shared about. So um, this one is let me do a little zoom in here. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question on the last slide. Um, yeah. So how, how much what sort of like, you know, is there a difference between the men's views on these issues or I know you said that there's a lot of overlap. I'm just sort of, is there anything that's sort of teasing out between the two? Yeah, so I think one of the things that was always uh, about, uh, you know, men was the reputation building and the ability to getting hired. That mm -hmm. I didn't see in this particular set, like, you know, they make their reputation, they sell their products, they make, you know, that kind of thing uh, was quite big with the earlier surveys of men. But I didn't see that here that they were doing it either for reputation building. And it's, I mean, in some of these cases also, they shared the idea of not even revealing their identity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're participating because of, you know, either the difference, whatever the reason, whatever their individual reason might be for hiding their identity. But that also means that they will not be able to use this reputation building or these skills on their CV. So that kind of disadvantages them too. So that is one thing that I, I didn't see. Uh, you know, in in this uh, sample, um, I did see you know that uh, thing of uh, <clears throat> wanting to make <clears throat> excuse me no. um, like a social change element that I really cared about. This this is an app about uh, how to keep women safe, and so I'm going to really spend all my time in it. I started as a hobby, and then I joined the team of developers who was working on it. So transitioning from uh, unpaid to paid. 
because the 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 you know the objectives of the project really appeal to me so if it succeeds then yeah yeah that's interesting okay thank you <laughs> yeah Yeah, so these are just some quotes from there um, that they thought the forum was the best way to learn. Um, I fixed some limitations in handling of product features and decided it might be useful to others. So again, I fixed it for myself, but then I thought it, you know, it's something that will work for other too. Opportunity to work with experienced people while still being an undergraduate. So again, another way <clears throat> I think we uh, can do a bit based on the numbers that uh, Jessica was sharing earlier. I think we can do a better job of embedding experiences for undergraduates um, to participate and to learn and to uh, not be intimidated, uh, you know, by uh, part for participating. Uh, <clears throat> And also just trying learning how to um, contribute supporting oss movement having freely accessible software so you know the philosophical foundation so this is again one of the common ones with men and women um then i ask you know again keeping uh, very much in mind that the women who participate in this uh, who respond to a survey like this or to people who respond to a diversity survey um and who um are you know working right now not quitting um they are the ones who are responding to this so you know we're keeping that in mind uh, when i ask them why women stay or why they stay why they continue to stay even though you know they um i'll share a little bit later about the first time experiences of you know if, if the first time experience wasn't good you still chose to stay what what are some of the reasons um and again same things here about reciprocity or it's a part of my job even if people are not being nice if this is what i have to do then this is what i have to do uh, some see it as an integral part of life i have always contributed and i always want to contribute to open source as i keep um you know on uh, with my career <laughs> belief in the philosophy you want to sustain uh, open source software so you know committed to this idea and this philosophy uh, learning in collaboration um, once they're established then having the recognition um, but i really of course like the one which did some of them said that i i actually am troubled by this two to three percentage numbers that we hear all the time about how many women are there uh, and also just around me how few women stay there and i stay so that i can help more women and i can you know um encourage and onboard and support newcomers um into these communities so i think that is great that there are people who want to do that <laughs> um and so these are some of the quotes from this uh, today i work for a company that pays me to contribute to oss i was initially interested in oss because i like the idea of working in the open sharing knowledge and being able to learn how any particular software works um, <clears throat> because i found that i had a natural knack for it and i'm good at it and what i at what i do and it excites me to be a part of something so huge and selfless and something that will be beneficial to the whole world um, so, you know, some of these things. So with that, you know, the next, uh, some of the next few things that I want to talk about is, you know, what were their experiences? So I asked them, you know, why you joined and why you stay. Um, but when you are there, what happens? What are some of the things that you have experienced? Um, and this is again in that same way, you know, that 80% of the women that I talked to said their first experience of participating in OSS was positive. Um, and they used words such as positive, exciting, good, enjoyable, fast, and simple. 10% uh, of the survey participants said negative and 10% had neutral. So, you know, what does this mean? This, you know, this um, overwhelming number of positive experience, positive first experience when they just started. Uh, means that they are there, right? So they stay there. If the first experience can somehow be curated, managed, monitored, supported, mentored, um, then I think, um, you know, we, we, we start at a solid footing and we can continue um, to have people stay longer if, if they're first, like, especially if it is a classroom setting, if it is a hackathon, if there are these types of things in which we can introduce these concepts and support, um, then that first experience uh, kind of uh, exposes them to the positive aspects of the movement and their, um, you know, their um, loyalty or their sense of being attached with this is, is gets strong early on. And so even if later on they have 
experiences that are negative, they would choose to um, stay. Um, you know, so even the, the very small percent, ten percent of women had negative experiences, but still chose to stay. So either they could, you know, whatever their individual reasons might be, uh, but I think this eighty percent had positive is a is an important number to think about. That if if the first uh, experience is positive, then hopefully you know that um, helps them in in staying and uh, kind of keeping on contributing. Then I asked them directly, you know, about if they believe that their contributions were treated same as men. Are women's contributions treated same as contributions from men? Uh, and it was like a like at scale. So we had about 52% responded negatively. So they didn't think that they were, uh, that women's contributions were treated same as contributions for uh, for men, from men. Uh, my contributions are sometimes challenged more than they would be if I was perceived as male. Um, they always considered mine less technical, uh, more likely to receive condescending, dismissive, or critical response. And all these, you know, mind you, with all these experiences, these are the women who choose to stay and who are contributing their time and energy and, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in this environment. Um, more tendency to question my technical abilities and to condescend and interrupt and put me down. Um, so, you know, these are the ways in which they so, uh, sh sh saw differences. I do think that the places I tend to contribute in OSS communities, documentation, testing, bug fixing, do sometimes get classed at women's work, um, which, you know, uh, is again, something that has been studied a lot in, you know, feminism uh, theories and, and a lot of gender studies that this word concept of women's work. Uh, and, you know, it came up again in studying women in open source as well. Uh, it gets classed as women's work or less skilled work or less technical work, even though they're essential. So from that perspective, yes, they're treated differently. Uh, more likely to be questioned. People expect more emotional labor, much nicer responses. So one of the examples was, you know, a woman said that if a man posts a fix, they say, here it is, I did it, it works. And if a woman does it, she has to complete, give a whole background on why she's doing it, why she knows, why she has a right to tell this. And, you know, give a whole explanation of why this should be accepted and not just about the uh, technical aspects. Um, so then, um, and again, um, if anyone uh, has any questions or, you know, would like to say, please go ahead. Um, so then I asked uh, them about- yeah. We've got a couple hands raised right now, Shua. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I can't yes. see the hands, so please, if you could just- yeah, we've got Shua that's... and Devai, so yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions, Vandana, in the yeah, chat. Right. So I thought, um, uh, I think Dawal uh, Gianni is asking uh, that did things improve the longer the respondents stayed in the project or it remained as bad as the beginning? Meaning uh, yeah. the perception of non-technical and then it's women's work kind of thing, I think. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, from what I have seen, the longer women are in the communities, they are able to, like I said, um, advocate for each other, support each other, make space for each other. And also, you know, one of the, the codes of conduct study that I did, which is, uh, you know, across five forums, in that one thing that we found is like they were talking about this idea of, you know, um, even in the governance of the community, you know, they um, had a woman who, you know, went like got in the election and was an, uh, elected to be part of the community council. And that was a deliberate effort. So the, those are the things, again, kind of reflecting back on what Jessica was saying, saying the things are improving, uh, but a uh, long way to go. So yes, when they are there and they are able to make a difference and they, you know, they um, commit to it, then then things in in that particular situation improve. Right. And then, um, um, sorry, Lauren, sorry. do you want to turn on uh, the microphone and ask a question, or do you want me to read your question out? Um, sure, I I do want to ask a slightly clarifying question. Okay. Um, and uh, this is more at an individual level as opposed to as the community as a whole. But for individuals, you know, can say they had a not a great start. Did it get better for them specifically the more they were in or did it remain the same? Okay, so the like the 10% who said their first experience was negative, but they stayed. So you're saying, was it because it got better? 
Uh, no, no, no. I'm just talking about the individual person. Any individual, you know, yeah. considering we're coming back and saying that, uh, yes, we were, our, our um, contributions are not being treated equally. Did they feel as, as the longer they stayed, they were treated more equally or we were still that bad? Yeah, I'm, I'm remembering one particular interview, just exactly what you're saying, um, where, you know, she said I was able to prove two or three times when my things would get rejected. I was able to prove that the suggestion that I had given was a better one. Uh, and then ultimately I was, you know, appointed a particular group, group leader. And so, so yes, if they kept showing up and kept contributing uh, and proving that their solution was there, um, then it improved for them for that, you know, in one in one particular interview, yes. And, and would I be correct in assuming that this barrier was higher for women as compared to an average male? Um, I don't know av what average male would be, but I think to, if we say to a North American white male, I would say yes. Okay, thank you. So there is another question, Vandana, uh, from Lauren. Um, is I'm going to read. Oh, okay, Hij, Lauren, join. Yeah, I managed to get a camera and a microphone working. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about the delay. <clears throat> so my question was related in that that uh, went back to the previous talk as well uh, <clears throat> to whether it would be possible to for for some of the problems that have been outlined um, to show some more concrete examples. Um, I'm thinking about people, women in this context, but in the previous talk, it was diversity in general as well. Uh, so any, any minority uh, who report that, they, <laughs> report that they feel unwelcome, that they feel aggressive behavior, and any kind of discriminatory behavior. Uh, <clears throat> I, I maybe I'm I'm lucky enough to work in projects or subsystems in the kernel or different areas where this is not too much of an issue and and maybe the the environment in which I work is more welcoming. But I, I'm experiencing a bit of a cognitive uh, dissonance here. I'm hearing what you say and the uh, the replies to the surveys, and I have no reason to disbelieve them. But at the same time, I don't see firsthand uh, evidence of that in my day-to-day -day work. And so I have a hard time understanding the actual extent of the problem and how it, uh, uh, how those things actu actually happen. And if I can't understand that, I also have, I think, a harder time to uh, respond to them. And maybe, <clears throat> maybe those behaviors are actually around me and I fail to see them. So I wonder if having actual examples would be something that could also help uh, the community at large to, uh, to, to become more effective fighting against this. Absolutely. And Lauren, you know, um, don't feel like, oh, I, you know, I'm asking, I'm, you know, I, I totally understand you're not disbelieving me. The question you're asking me when I present these things, that's what I get. I always get this question that, well, I don't see it or it doesn't happen around me. And uh, not to, you know, typecast in any way, but it is always, I, I get this question from men, white men, especially that they don't see it or they don't see it around them. So I think for me, that's why one of the objectives overall for my research and I'm talking about just challenges but I think really one of the main things is this awareness that it is happening mm. and we need to be sensitized towards it and need to pay attention towards it and that is the only way we will get allies and that is the only way we will get uh, a community around people who are feeling these things but it's not as obvious maybe to everybody and so in terms of finding examples in several of my studies yes there's uh, many many examples and I can you know email you some of the uh, transcripts from the interviews but if you wanted to look at yourself you could look up on any of these women um, uh, mailing list for Debian, Ubuntu, you know, yeah, that's true as well. yes. go there and go and yeah. just search <laughs> yeah. um, pornography, rape threats, just do a keyword, like just do a quick search and you will see responses for that masculinity, mis you know, mi misogyny, all the, if, even if you just did a keyword search, you would get, uh, now again, it is a reported behavior not observed. So all the survey forums that I uh, analyzed, I analyzed about 11,000 messages from about 1,350 women, uh, but they are, they are writing their experiences of this is what I felt. Mm -hmm. Now we can also say, well, maybe, you know, we, again, I'm not observing it. I'm seeing what they are writing and asking advice on. And, um, you know, so yes, that these things are happening. And I think one of the big things that as a community we need to do is 
be aware. So aware, I think lack of awareness, this is a slide I was gonna share is, it's about the status of diversity. So just the percentage is like two to 3% women. And that's 20 years ago, we found there were two, you know, 15 years ago, I think we found there were two to 3% and we're not above 5% even now. Mm. Uh, just women and then if we go deeper into racial diversity among women or you know non-binary gender then of course in the results from jessica also we saw these examples of toxicity and harassment that are more there so i think just this awareness for everybody would be way, very helpful in in uh, in <laughs> yes just one minute um and so the awareness for status of diversity, value of diversity, like, you know, it doesn't bother me, my team is doing well, what would, how would it help for us to be diverse? Uh, and also the level of the hostility, discrimination and harassment, because always I get asked this, like, is it really even a problem? Uh, it is for the ones who are facing it. Yes. And then what is the impact of it? Do they leave communities because of this? And that's a, a positive, yes, they do. A lot of them do. And that's why even interviewing them is difficult because they're not there. You know, so thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Anita raised her hand, and I think then that'll pretty much be it, pretty much be it for this session. But we'll have more time for discussion later in the set, later yeah, in everything. Sure, so, sure. and it, you just turn on the camera. Don't worry about raising the hand. <laughs> yeah, I can't see that. So yes. Yeah. I I just wanted to say like you know um, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. I I'll just go. It is it is harder if you are in in your um you know white male highly tech bubble to see what's happening with others you might not see it or there's so much communication going on right and if you think from the minorities perspective if they keep if they want to talk about the harassment it seems like they're complaining and whining and it just gives you more and more negative perception but as vandana said allies are super 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 important and actually valerie aurora who was a linux i believe a linux kernel um uh, contributor, she runs this ally workshop, which has been really, really fantastic to get an idea about what's happening. And, you know, for people with this aha moment, like they didn't know what was happening and it gives them verbiage about how to do something if they see something. So if any of you are interested, I put the link there. It is a really great workshop is what I have heard. Absolutely. Yes. And there's also for women, there's a, an organization called Thrive Wise. I think it's also supported by Linux Foundation. Uh, Rupa Desher runs it and uh, she does safe space panels. Um, and, you know, they're doing something next week. I'm participating in that and that is on microaggressions. So just, you know, in uh, how women deal with microaggressions, but it's the safe space panels and these type of uh, workshops uh, are very um, are the places to learn about it because it, you know what what the question earlier was it is very correct that um, awareness is just not there like i don't see it is it even happening uh, i think i'm way over my time <laughs> right <laughs> okay well we'll we'll, get, well we'll lead like i say i think we probably should wrap it up and then uh, turn it over to bianca and then we'll eat into the break a little bit for her <laughs> yeah yeah just uh, i'm i'm good yeah you're good well, yeah. thank you very much that was that's been an excellent presentation and you've got some good discussions going which is the goal for this type of yeah. mini comp so appreciate that and yeah. with that i will queue up um i'll take the presenter thing over and queue up bianca's um and hey bianca Let me... Hi. oops sorry we were farther ahead on the slide let me just queue it back up to the start for you there you go and I'll give you the presenter mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bianca Trinkenreich. I am a PhD student at Northern Arizona University, and I'm going to present you some preliminary insights from our recent survey that was closed one day ago. So we ran the survey in collaboration with the Linux kernel uh, community managers, Shua and Kate, also with my professors, Igor Steinmacher and Marco Gerosa, and in collaboration with Anita Sarma, who is here, and Daniel German. So, uh, I have the presenter. And... Hopefully you can present it. Yeah, good. So about this study, we wanted to understand what is happening inside the Linux kernel. This is specific for the Linux kernel. Because the overall goal and the ultimate goal of this research is to create strategies to increase and, and retain the contributors there. Okay, but in the lens of 
diversity. We want a diverse set of contributors because diversity, we all know, bring productivity and all stuff like that. So we received 309 answers and I'm going to present you now the preliminary results. About the gender demographic, 10% of the answers that we received are from women, also 1.9% from non-binaries, and others like people who prefer not to say or left in blank uh, were about 4%. So the numbers are uh, very connected to the overall percentage of, participa of women participation in open source that is ranging around 8 to 10%. Uh, more than 40% contribute less than four hours a week from the respondents we had. And they are spread around the world, very similar to the overall open source contributors that are mainly in USA, Germany. And after that, our respondents were more uh, concentrated in India, UK and China. And I'm, I'm showing those five countries because I'm doing some demographic some segmented analysis per gender and country, and I'm going to use the five top countries. Okay. Uh, we asked about the incentives. Why? Because the Linux kernel and many other uh, large communities are now having this distribution of paid and volunteer contributors. So we wanted to understand the seizures. First question was, have you ever been paid to contribute to Linux kernel in any time? Uh, the person who, uh, the, the, most of the, the respondents are currently being paid. Another part a word was being paid in the past, but it's not anymore. And only a few part of the respondents were only paid during the first contributors. Contributions. So uh, about past decisions. From those who used to be passed, used to be paid in the past, the 24%, but they are now not paid anymore. When you were no longer paid, what did you do? So most of the respondents, they, they didn't leave the kernel immediately. They volunteered to contribute to new code or to code, even new or maintaining their own code. So we are wonder, wondering about the decisions because we don't want contributors to leave. And besides asking uh, about past decisions, we also asked about some possible future decisions. So for the, the contributors who are currently being paid to contribute, that are 76%, what would they do? What would be their decision if they stop being paid? Would they leave? This is what we don't want. So uh, most of the, the respondents would not leave and they would find another employee to continue being paid to contribute. So if they stop being paid, they would not immediately leave, at least not immediately. We also asked about motivations. Motivations were, uh, is, a, uh, is a very explored human factors that uh, Vandana was just talking about. But we asked uh, using some categories, some congregated categories from uh, previous uh, research that we did. And most of the, if we see the response as an overall from all the respondents, uh, career, philosophy, and having fun were the most uh, motivations for the most reasons to contribute to Linux kernel. But when we do, and, and when we ask, and, and when we segregate per country, and for the five countries with, the, with more respondents, we can see a little imbalance. What is this imbalance? For example, India. India is a very interesting case. So almost all the contributors, 91%, are motivated by collaboration and kinship. Let's go back to understand what is collaboration and kinship. And it's like, I want to collaborate. I deeply enjoy helping others, which is part of altruism. I want to share my knowledge. I want to participate. I want to be with others on the team. So 91% of motivate from India are motivated because of that. And 96% are motivated because they enjoy. They like to have fun. And they want to continue to have fun. Then we ask it another shift. Okay, people can join because of a reason, can stay because of another reason, and what is future? What do you want next? 
and we explore this next as a meaning of success. When you ask people what means success for you, it can be the next motivation of doing something. It can be the perception of my future goals. What do I want next? And we ask this question following also our, our previous research like that. I, are you, do you feel yourself a successful contributor? Most of the people are around 80% answered yes. And, or in 21% answered two. For either ways, we ask the meanings of success. So for those who answer yes, we ask it. I am a successful contributor because all those reasons. And the, the, ans the person answers no, I would be a successful contributor if I had the following reasons. So putting it all together, the respondents want in the future to keep bringing value solutions. So this means success for the contributors and also to have fun. Having fun, enjoying it is something very important for the overall contributors. If we segregate it by gender, we can, we can see that all genders value bringing contributors and having fun. But here in yellow, we can see that contributors in gender minorities, and for that, I aggregated women and non-binaries only because of the sake of uh, amounts, because we didn't have enough numbers to separate non-binaries and women here. But when we put the minorities together, we can see that, that they don't see leather in the career as much as men. So they answered, oh, being a maintainer or a contributor, a community manager, it doesn't mean such a success for me. So it's only 8% of them answered that being a success, that, that having success is leather in the career. And then we can think, why is that? Isn't it because they can have, they can face some glass ceiling? They cannot see, they can go up. What is happening there? We are going further. The meanings for success for country also show some interest in that. Uh, for China, for example, bringing value contributions and being able to work in any kind of issue, very focused to results, it means a success. While for India, Having fun, which was also a motivation to guess, is also a meaningful success. So, so if we look to India, uh, they join and they are there now. One of the reasons is they, because they enjoy, they want to collaborate with others, but they want also to keep having this fun in the future. So we really want need to understand what makes them enjoy and what leads them from enjoying. The sense of belonging is another uh, human factor that we ask it. So we ask it uh, if I, f six questions from, from the psychology related to the sense of belonging. We want to understand how much the contributors belong. They feel they belong to the Linux kernel. If we look this graph as an overall the, from the respondents, we say, oh, uh, very much like uh, Jessica said, as an overall, everyone feels belong, every, everything is going just fine. So, um, but if we segregate by gender, we can see that uh, some slight difference between gender regarding the sense of belonging, but they exist. I feel that I belong to the group was, uh, more disagreed by the minorities than, the, than from men, and it was more agreed by men than the minorities. So there are some slight differences that we need to explore it more. And 65% of the minorities don't consider they are known for the group. This is a concept about being visible. So people don't know me, people don't know who I am. So 65% really uh, think that they are like, not known by the group. If we look, but we also segregated by the countries for the overall questions, and we could observe that for China, 35% don't feel they belong to the group. The group. This is different from the other countries, and 77% don't consider they are being they are known by others. They also feel like invisible, and there can be a. Uh, such a consequence of that, 
because another question was, uh, I want to contribute more, but I don't feel valued. And 31% from China agreed with that. So possibly the lack of sense of belonging can be hindering uh, contributions from China contributors, and we need to look at that. Uh, and another way, let's see India. So in, from India, nobody answered they don't feel belonging. Every, every answer was related to, yes, I feel that I belong to the group. And also nobody, 0%, asked, they agreed that they are not feeling at home. So the, India, they, they, they are feeling this sense of belonging. And if we look at the contributions question, only 5% would contribute more. And compared to China, we can see that they are belonging and they are also, uh, they are like safe to do contributions. So let's look at the challenges. Uh, the challenge was uh, an open question. So we could, uh, we asked what difficulties, what barriers do you face while contributing to Linux kernel? And they segregated the challenges between process, technical, and social challenges. Between the process to contribute, there were challenges related to sending contributions. So for example, sending patches through mailing lists is hard, is, it has many problems. Uh, there, are, there is some dilemma or some conflict about sending small contributions. Maintainers from one side, they consider overwhelming but contributors consider small contributions are not being valid. About receiving re uh, reviews, uh, already said here, uh, they, they are considering there are long delays for answers and there are answers with no, no answer questions about with questions. So nobody is answering when a contributor has some questions about the review, nobody's answered like an echo. And there are some non-actionable, like reviews with, that with only uh, small text and high demanding reviews that are, being, are making contributions be harder than they are. When getting the contribution accepted, uh, contributors feel there are unwritten rules. What can be acceptable? It's not clear what is a contribution that is going to be acceptable or not. And a contributor needs to be accepted and trusted by the maintainers to have a contribution accepted. So that is, they are feeling some lack of transparency about the rules to have a contribution being accepted. And also about re resistance to change. So, so they feel that maintainers avoid raising new maintainers, even being overwhelmed, even being burned out. And that is, it's hard to change what is being there. It's hard to change the rules. It's hard to change the, the standards. Uh, Jeff has a question here. How much of the difference between India and China feeling of belonging in the project are due to language barriers? I didn't analyze this yet, Jeff, but I have this data and I'm going to analyze further, okay? Because we also asked it about uh, what is your proficiency in English? both for technical and for social interactions. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges, uh, challenges first I, I thought about the social challenge, but it's not only social, it's about the many frictions. There are many frictions in there. So as we were already talking in the session, the toxic communications help, uh, happen a lot. Happen only to women, but happen to all genders. So. Uh, People are complaining, and even maintainers are complaining that other maintainers are harsh during interactions. There is a lot of hostile interactions in the mailing list and all kinds of communications. And some contributors, they feel scared, they feel intimidated about what is the pushback that I'm going to receive when I send this patch. And what is interesting is that we could see that some people complain about this view of toxic communication and some people complain about the toxic communication itself uh, in men in means of there is no balance uh, of, uh, about what doing an honest feedback and receiving it at toxic you know so it's hard for people we need to uh, train people on the soft skills to have a balance between doing this feedback in an honest way and not uh, uh, going over the barrier of being clashing. We need to, to have this balance every time. 
there are a lot of conflicts, views and interests being said between maintainer and maintainer, between maintainer and contributors, between paid and voluntary contributors, and also contributors who care more about their own reputation than the Linux kernel code. So there are a lot of conflicts, views and interests to be solved. Technical, there are also technical barriers. So a, lo a lot of people mention steep learning curve. It's hard. The, the, the code is hard. It's hard to familiarize with the architecture and the coding base. Uh, a lot of people, uh, some people ask, uh, also complained about the environment issue, mainly about testing and, and having outdated architectures there in Linux. Uh, not having documentation, or when we have documentation, they, it's obsolete, it's lack of updates, so it's hard to keep up with the rapid change in the code base. Also, unwritten standards, some, some subsystems have some have standards different from the others, and it's hard for one person to understand what, what is that documented. And the classical newcomer barrier, so lack of mentorship, find the resources. Uh, I know there are some, some trainees, but some newcomers want to self-learn. So they feel it's hard to find the resource for this self-learning and to start understanding something. And the beginners are uh, always looking for a good first issue. It's a label we can put in the, in the issue and they can hardly find this in Linux kernel to start a contribution. Uh, personally, there were challenges that are like lack of available time. I don't have time to contribute. I'm doing this as part of my work or I'm going to do, I'm doing this as part of my work, but it's not priority, it's competing with other tasks. Uh, lack of monitor, monitoring incentives, lack of money. I'm not getting paid to contribute and others say, uh, I want to have a job as a Linux kernel uh, developer, but I cannot find, I'm not getting hired. So we can support contributors on, on that way. And feeling overloaded, feeling overloaded was highly cited, mostly by maintainers, but like they receive uh, too much work. They have to deal with almost getting burnout. But at the same time, we could see that others are complaining they are not helping to raise new maintainers. So we have a conflict there. And the class call also work-life balance issues, like we need to balance with kids, with family, like I had my daughter sent, going to school and could barely see me, sent me a flower, happens a lot. So let's look all together. And this is my research is about looking all together, uh, all the concepts are motivation, success and everything and, and see Putting this in a big picture, how can we attract and retain contributors from gender minorities? If we look at women and non-binary, they represented around 10% of their overall response. 57% uh, live at India, United States, uh, Germany, and Romania. 68% of the, the minorities feel successful, which is a little bit uh, lower than the overall rate. And they seek for uh, having fun and making contributions, they don't, they don't see as lettering the career. Uh, the main challenges uh, faced or reported by the minorities was about toxic communication, which is not new, and also the, the long delays. The sense of belonging, they don't feel belonging as an overall and they feel invisible. So let's put it in the discussion. Considering all of that, how do you feel? that we can do to increase the numbers of gender minorities. Any ideas? Besides the code of conduct, besides enforcing a code of conduct, look, enforcing a code of conduct, uh, training in contributors in soft skills to try to reduce the tox communication, what else? We really need to understand what is fun for contributors, don't we? So people are saying, I contribute because I have fun. But what is having fun for you? We need to understand. So uh, 
The next step will be interviewed for deep analysis. And as I'm aligned to what Vandana was saying, we are also going to interview people who left the Linux kernel to understand the reasons. But, and now it's open for you to help. Which challenges from those that you face and you feel is more impacting? Do anyone want to share the camera here? Talk about the challenge? I know it's hard to show itself. <laughs> Let's go to the second. What would you recommend the kernel to do? Or advices? Well, I'll come to the company here. Um, so I think I've seen um, from the earlier sessions, we've also been hearing the, the notion of putting together some training for mentors. I think that's one of the things we've uh, picked up on. Um, we're dealing with uh, giving feedback um, and communication. So trying to figure out, you know, tips and so forth for that. And I think Shua has some ideas in that direction. Um, that might be worth and then you know what's fun for contributors in the chat we're seeing you know getting together in person at conferences um i think there's a large part of our community that likes to do that and to be you know be able to hang out and talk about things with you know people who understand what they're talking about um uh, but in days like this uh you know it has we haven't been able to do it for a while on the other hand um you know finding most of the community is online, so I, I, you know, I guess I'm curious about, I'm curious too what other people find is fun. Yeah, because we need to, like, we need to cultivate this fun, right? It, mm -hmm. Fun is so important to all people. We need to cultivate it. So we need to understand what is fun and what would make you stop having fun. Like, it's so important. Yeah, uh, Veronica, I also agree that in-person conferences are so important. I'm going next week to Seattle, to the Open Summit. Hi, Shua, do you want to say something? You are on mute. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm browsing the chat to see uh, if there are any questions that we want to tackle. Uh -huh. um, I have a question about looks onboarding looks like like to know how, how to get onboarded and learn expectations from contributors. Sorry. Um, there are uh, mentorship programs, uh, Diana. To uh, for uh, we have uh, uh, there is a I put in a link for um, on uh, there is a mentorship program Linux uh, Foundation mentorship program and then also there is the webinar series that you can kind of get a feel for how to get uh, get started at least, and then have tips on how to continue to contribute. And you see that uh, in these mentorship programs, we could include not only the technical part, but also the social, how to interact, how to guide the others, how to, to read the review and see, because sometimes people can answer, okay, it's approved, thanks. And for me, it could be okay. For others, it could be not okay. Yeah. We need to understand the cultural differences, like Constantine was saying. You know, sometimes people uh, complain it. I'm going back to the challenges here. Uh, people complaining about not receiving an answer when the, not receiving a, even a feedback when the contribution is accepted. Yeah. It can be like, I don't know. Only it's a maintain a bandwidth issue, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when people receive a lot of patches, and sometimes what happens is it, the messages come through automated bots. Uh, Constantin said in the uh, in the chat that um, there are regional differences, ge geographical mm -hmm. differences in how a particular cryptic answer is perceived. For example, apply things wouldn't mm -hmm. be uh, a polite answer based on where you are from. Um, and so, th so those are the kinds of things as well. So we are looking at multiple things. I think we are looking at geographical diversity where some of these inclusive language issues come up and we tend to be, that is another thing that I keep thinking about as, as much as uh, uh, making a place welcome, it's also, there is a language barrier 
uh, for a lot of people. English is not the first language for a lot of people. And the second thing for them is uh, sometimes um, that we have to use the language that is more inclusive in the sense that it's understandable. Um, mm -hmm. I have faced the same thing myself. I would use language that is uh, um, North American centric and I need to kind of step back and say, okay, will a developer from um, another geographical region understand the feedback I'm giving? So you have to kind of step back and think about how it will be, uh, will that make sense to somebody um, that is receiving the feedback? So what are they hearing? Uh, if we can focus on what they are hearing versus what we are saying, um, it's clear in our head, but that, that would be helpful as well. Yeah. There seem to be co uh, some questions in the chat as well. Um, is yeah. There... Feel free to like, you know, turn your camera on and ask directly if we don't catch you. Yeah. Because I'm trying to read everything and like, <laughs> I think it's I'm going to be slower. Than fast, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I'm not a shy person, so I'll go again. This is Anita. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to build on uh, on Shua's thing about uh, I have heard this too that language plays a role like you know um, when you're trying to engage someone or explain something that's how do you explain language can be a barrier but also I think it's important to know the motivation it is really good that open source has become such a big thing and that many people are doing open source also for their CV especially in China and India I think uh, people are very um, career oriented so they do things to get things off on on the checklist so we also have to see like what is the motivation of the contribution is it because some uh, is it because of employment this is what i've heard that some people are making the patches because it is a requirement from their employer this was mm -hmm. someone who was talking about china and um, in that case they are just doing it as something they have to do not necessarily to be engaged in the community so i think there are like so many factors that play into uh, the interaction and I don't know what the answer is but I think it's it needs to be in a holistic way what is their language what is their background in education and and talking in online communities why are they submitting that all plays into a factor into how the interaction would go and the engagement would stay or not stay so some way of I knowing the background would be useful uh, complementing what you're saying if we look at China here in the graph let me circle. I don't know how to circle. Oh, I don't know how to circle. Yeah. But if you look China and the own use in the graph, it's the last line of every every question. They are not contributing because of own use, and own use includes personal and professional reasons. So they are they only fourteen percent of that consider they con they contribute because of your own use. But 73% contribute because of career and professional development. If, and if we go to the categories, we see that on use, yeah, on use would cover professional and personal purposes, like scratching on you on each, but also because my boss asked me. But they are interested in something more about the career because they are paid. And this is, can be conflicting. Like, I contribute because I'm paid, or I contribute because my, my boss asked me. This can be, those two, I, I understand they could be uh, conflicting, but uh, the own use appeared very low in China. So if they are not confused because of, from, the, from the question, uh, they would contribute because of, more because of career and other reasons related to career than simply because my boss asked. No, I don't know. What do you think? You're shy again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true, right? But um, what I'm also wondering is um, people are so busy already, right? Now this is yet another thing to do. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what the answer would be. Uh, I think it might be almost useful to have like an onboarding orientation mentoring kind of a thing uh, to get people uh, interested excited because i worry now if i'm a busy maintainer now i have to understand okay why does bianca want to contribute what is her language i have to make 
so much extra effort and there is the conversation going on when they say yes thank you feedback you know thanks for all the fish let's move on even writing i mean when i write emails right sometimes i just write very small emails because thanks i'm moving on because i'm busy um it's it's such a big ask also so i don't know how to load balance so that it's it's easy so maybe there could be like a organizational level onboarding or organization level engagement that could work out because i worry putting too much work on individuals who are already many of them contributing mm -hmm. as voluntary uh, participation mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're also seeing the comments about things are not the same between subsystems oh, yeah. as well. And so maybe coming up with um, some ways of sort of standardizing on what sort of the reference practices are. And there may there'll still be variants, but maybe at least setting a baseline so that people have a clue of, you know, what I think, they I think that's and let, and let them come up with the baseline, quite frankly, you know. So I don't know if it was with you, Shua, or, or um, Kate, when we were discussing, we, I thought we said at some point it would be good to like have like a code review template, just like there is, you know, pack submission template, because then you could, you know, if there is something you have to say about why you are thinking this is acceptable, not acceptable, will make people write something, hopefully, or at least give them a clue that this is something is useful. So having those templates or actually uh, good examples might be one way to reduce the burden and help mm -hmm. with the more standardized approach to giving feedback. So we do have a lot of documentation uh, on that, submitting patches, and we go into a mm -hmm. lot of detail on what would make a patch a good patch. Um, there is so much of the documentation. Um, it's not lack of documentation uh, for sure, but uh, um, maybe, Anita, as you're saying, maybe there got to be a template checklist um easier to read than a document maybe that's kind of what i'm hearing um so it's not it, there is there it, the submitting patches document also goes into differences um between uh, if there is a big difference between a couple of subsystems mm -hmm. it also identifies that um, mm -hmm. but what what i'm kind of hearing is maybe it needs to be like a quick uh cheat sheet kind of uh just a, a one that that makes them think. Just like you know, you have an issue template when you write, and you know these other ways to write it. It just is easier than to think back, especially for newcomers, right? If you have been giving good feedback for a while, you know what to give. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the chat. Maybe you want to highlight those. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's been some more discussion about the wording for the thanks mm -hmm. um, right. and how, you know, thanks applied and, you know, can we sort of work up and I guess it heads into some of the inclusive language areas for some of the automation <laughs> responses. Um, I had seen previous research talking about bots mm -hmm. to, 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 look, to read the answers. So you could uh, use bots to at least try to find some uh, non-inclusive terms being used in the answer and then help the person who is writing the review, for example. Yeah. And then Diona's basically saying it might make some sense to um, create sort of a funnel where we connect folks into common and regional cohorts of new contributors so they can self-support each other and have a community that way. I think that seems like a definitely an idea worth exploring. Yeah, in the notes. Um, Okay, well, I'm just looking at the clock and I realized we've gone yeah. over now, which, but we said we would for you. So, okay. since <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. we have 10 minutes into the break, um, Kate. So, so we probably uh, should yeah, you. Take, take it to the break. But thank you very much for all the work you've been doing. Bianca. Thank you, Bianca. That's awesome. Thank, thank you for yeah. your for the opportunity for the collaboration. Yeah. Thank you for the respondents. Uh, and, and yeah, we are going further. We are going to create uh, strategies, but we are going to create informed strategies. So now we, we are not uh, create from the head. We are going to create based on all those, uh, those human factors because they, they affect the decision to participate or not. So we are going further and I thank you very much everyone for the participation, for the collaboration. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Daniel, Igor, and Markov, too, my professors. <laughs> Thanks, Bianca. Okay, I will take the presenter and um, put up the break signal.
people can continue to chat in the chat and I think we'll resume that we'll resume at the top of the hour so it's colon zero zero all right hello everyone welcome back this is an awesome event there's so much conversations going on it's almost hard to keep track of it um, so what I'm going to talk about today is mentoring at scale and how can we acknowledge the informal implicit mentoring that goes on through code reviews. I'm Anita Sarma. I am associate professor at Oregon State University. Uh, my research is mainly focused on human factors and software uh, development. And one of my passions has been how to improve DEI in open source. And what I'm thinking is this is like a three pronged um, thrust or three thrusts that I would like to um, get you folks uh, started on. First is the awareness that open source and tech in general does have a DEI issue, right? And we have seen the past presentations and many academic and uh, industry reports that shows that. And each individual's story is real. And, you know, it is, it, it, it's important that we get as many people in as possible. The second part I want to focus on is that Oftentimes, DEI or improving DEI seems like this additional um, work, like this is a side issue. But I want you to think about, no, it's actually not a side issue because if you are open, if you are uh, improving your DEI, that would mean you are able to get more people in your projects, which would help with some of the burnouts that people have been talking about in the chat in the in the maintainers list, right? So having more contributors is actually going to make it easier, make your project more productive. So it's not a side issue; it should be a main issue. But finally, the third point is most open source developers are voluntary uh, contributors, and we have to see what we can do to make this improving DEI as simple, as effort-free as possible, um, because we don't want to burn out people out, right? So what can we do putting our heads together that can more easily make improving DEI possible for maintainers? Uh, this work that we are going to talk about is, is more data-centric than the past works we have looked at. And I would like to thank my collaborators, the first two our little faces over there are my student, and the third one is Iftikhar, who is at University of California, Irvine. So one of the first things we wanted to look at was um, mentoring is really important. It is definitely very important in education. It has also been shown to be very important in uh, commercial development. And Shua over here, you know, there are so many mentoring programs that are out there. So first we wanted to look at what are the different ways mentoring actually is going on in open source. We did some in interviews with uh, Linux Foundation people and uh, with Apache Source Foundation people. And from there we said like, okay, there is formal mentoring, Outreachy and Google Summer of Code and other mentorship programs that exist. But a lot of individuals were saying they actually found informal mentoring to be more efficient, more successful. And the mentees basically reached out to mentors to ask about certain things. Some could be career, could be technology. So where they are informally seeking out. But there is also this other part, which is implicit mentoring that is actually occurring in everyday activities. And this is what I'm going to focus on here. And we call this mentoring that happens through say code reviews or other regular channels as implicit mentoring. And here is actually a quote directly picked up from one of the interviewees. So this was this was great. It is basically mentoring is not just one off deal or you have to have this um, office hours either, right? So that is great. But actually, mentoring is happening in everyday development activities, for example, code reviews. And there might be other channels that I would love to listen to and see what exists. But the main thing is this kind of implicit mentoring happens where a mentor is providing an underlying explanation or when suggesting instructions or mechanisms to address some errors, right? So you're already giving some instructions, but if you can give some more explanation of why this might be happening or give some uh, teaching through that review, then it can bring uh, your mentee and their sk uh, skill set up. So we wanted to focus how much of implicit mentoring is actually happening because our interviewees said that it happens on an everyday basis and that even senior people are learning constantly from the uh, mentoring that happens through this code reviews. 
So what we wanted to look at was looking through data to see how much of implicit mentoring actually happens. We uh, mined 37 repositories in the Apache Source Foundation project and those that were actually available in GitHub. We mined about 97,000 pull requests, totaling about 11,000 plus contributors. And from there, uh, we looked at the pull requests with uh, our ex uh, um, rule set being there has to be an explanation and we created some training data through and then we ran machine learning. If you're interested, basically there were three rules that was gone into creating this training set, which was there has to be an explanation accompanying any kind of GitHub pull request comments when there were instructions or suggestions or any mechanism to fix errors. And then we ran the classifier and we got very good results. Um, it was 0.9 AUC or 90% uh, AUC, which is a, a goodness measure. And our precision, I believe, was at 96%. So our training, uh, training data was human created and the machine learning did well. And from there, we kind of said, okay, now that we know we can classify this large scale data, how much of mentoring is actually happening? We found about 30% 30 30 of pull requests included some implicit mentoring. That is, there was someone who gave a good explanation about why you know, the work should change or something about it. And about 25% of the contributors in our data set, that is a th a 37 projects, served as implicit mentors, right? So kind of a minority, right? It's like 25%, one fourth of the, of the contributors are doing this, but it's still happening. And one of the things when we had looked at the interviews and past research, mentoring was often seen as this dyadic one-on-one -on -one and top-down uh, relationship. So we wanted to look at that, especially you know, given its pull request in an open forum, more people can comment. So we found that the majority, 65% of this mentoring relationship was dyadic. So there was one mentor who gave you know, feedback teaching to the mentee. But there were also cases where there are three people involved, so 22%, and in some cases, 12%, right? So it does in open source, I, I read it, one of the comments, like it takes a village, right? So making good contributors, onboarding them is, is a collaborative effort. The other thing was, is it really top down? And not just top down, so we had uh, 13 plus 34, so the majority was still top down, but we have bottom up where um, we decided in a top down or bottom up or peer, meaning six months. So if I'm a contributor, anybody who has they made their first commit within six months are my peer. Those who have made their commits um, before six months are above me, top, and the rest are uh, below me. So we had peer to peer about 34%. And the other thing was, given this is mentoring happening through pull request, they were topical, they were interest driven. And this would be some discussion I would bring up later that kind of made us think about, could this be something that is called like drive by mentoring, where you have some topic of interest and you want to teach about the topic, can there be short um, time, uh, very directed mentoring about that particular technical topic? So given this is DEI, the next question was, okay, mentoring is happening, about 25% are doing, 30% pull requests. Does gender play any role at all? So the first thing was to find gender from data. So we use the name SOAR ML API, which uses the first and last names and the zip code to identify what the gender might be. It also gives you some confidence level of how confident it is. We put a threshold of 90% because academic research in the past has used this. And from there, we kind of identified, you know, the number of women in the pull requests that we had in our data set. And if you can look at it, you know, there were actually five projects that had no women at all and started from 1% to 12%. So Jessica's 14% uh, is still the highest I have seen in any research. So, you know, there were women, but not that many. So then we said, okay, so let's remove those blue projects altogether because there are no women. And for the rest of the projects, we started looking at, okay, does gender play any role? Um, so when we looked at, okay, who is doing implicit mentoring? There are more men, um, but 94% of the men 
had participated in implicit mentoring and only 5% of the women were there. But remember, um, like, sorry, so 5% were women and 94% were men. And of this implicit mentoring, almost everyone who were men were also implicit mentors and women also. We found just based on the percentages that men perform implicit mentoring more often. So then we did a proportionality test because the proportions are so off, right? And in proportionality tests, we did find that yes, the percentages held true. Men were doing 7% more, statistically significant, but the effect side was very low. So this kind of gives an idea of like, you know, um, those who are doing mentoring, men and women are, are both doing implicit mentoring, which is good. Then we wanted to say, okay, men are doing implicit mentoring, women are doing implicit mentoring. In the past research, it has been shown that uh, homophily exists, which means um, people like to give feedback or like to stay together with those who are like that. That's homophily. So we wanted to look at, okay, so what kind of gender uh, pairing exists within this mentor menti pairs? And the largest percentage was homophily, right? So again, 96% and more are um, same gender pairs. So we ran tests just to make sure, but yes, they were all statistically significant. So overall and across all this top down, peer to peer and bottom up, there is homophily. And if you look at um, the top down, like men, 96 to 96 percentage are doing top down, that means men are mentoring other men. Same with peer and same with uh, bottom up. In the women, there are many fewer people, but you can still see that you know the peer-to-peer -peer group is the most women-to-women, -women, much less in top-down and also in bottom-up. But again, the question was, uh, let's see what actually um, happens if you look at, most people are in homophily. What about those who are actually crossing the aisle? If you look at that, just looking at the cross-gender implicit mentoring, the small 5% data, in this case, women tended to give mentoring um, to men more often than men. Um, yeah, than the opposite. So it happened about 56% times more. So homophily exists, but in the few times that women are uh, like cross gender mentoring happens, women give more mentoring to men than men give to women. So with this data, one of the, the few things I wanted to start a discussion, I kept the meeting short, uh, the slide a deck short. Is there, what do you think about homophily and implicit mentoring? This is happening through code reviews. And I was very, very surprised because I did not expect to see this much of a percentage of same gender mentoring than cross gender. And one of my concerns is as such, we have few women. So if we have this kind of boundary of men and women, are women getting less mentoring than men are? So I would like to hear what your thoughts are on this. Sure, do you wanna read in what's coming from the chat? Um, yes, um, I have one question, Anita, on uh, uh, gender-based mentoring. Mm -hmm. Is that is that uh, specific to some projects or across the board, all open source projects? Um, this was what we did with these 37 projects because we collected the data from 37 Apache projects and oh. these are the projects basically. And again, uh, this is a smaller data set than all the mentors because when NameSor was not confident if it's a man or a woman, we did not use that in our analysis. So only when this ML algorithm was like more than 90% confident that it's a man, man or a woman, we picked that data. But this whole data set is this 37, this universe is 37 projects in ASF. Right. Uh, in some of Daniel's results that he'll be going through, that it's, it's picking up on the fact that we don't have many um, maintainers for their women. And so that may also, and we don't have a lot of senior people, I think. In the kernel, um, I think there's been, what? I think there's like three women that have over a thousand commits and there's um, something like 250 men. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, you know, those who have experience, we don't have that many women that have experience. So that could be uh, in the kernel community, anyhow, that could be a factor. Okay. Um, so is it, what am I hearing? Like, so what I'm not, I'm not sure is like, why is there so few men mentors and women mentee, right? So women are few, mm -hmm. that's okay. But there are so many more men who are mentors, right? Why this, this, this boundaries, which I was very surprised, like in, in person to person, I know, and there is research from education literature that says, um, in informal mentoring, homophily is actually more efficient and preferred by women because otherwise there is, you know, suppression and, um, you know, lack of men, uh, role models effect. So in, in real life, with two humans are interacting, I could see that, but I was very surprised to see it also in pull request comments. Yeah. Angela, Angela's asking, raised her hand. So just come ahead and unmute Angela and join us. Ask the question or type it in the chat, whichever is easiest. Is that? Uh, I think I think she's working the platform. I know it takes a while to <laughs> unmute, unmute. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's in listen-only mode. Okay, but let's see if she can come on. Hey. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you joined in listen-only mode, so you probably can't you know type. You may want to drop off and rejoin um, in participate mode. Yeah, that'll be work. Um, So even if not here, but later on, I'm uh, Kate or sure anybody else. I'm I'm like I have my um, you know details later on. I'm just very curious of this division. I expected more men to women mentoring to happen just because of the number of mm -hmm. men maintainers or men in in a higher you know expertise that exists. Uh, this was just mind boggling to me, and I I am very surprised um, as well. Curious. I'm surprised as well. Um, um, with this so we double check and triple check our data because I was like, there must be a mistake, but it it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> so that it, it's surprising in the sense that um, it it is it it does pose a problem in some ways because we have a lot more men in a lot of the communities, and that uh, we won't be uh, it it will not be practical for us to be able to pair, um, you know, homophily pairs. So how do we accomplish our goals? So I set myself a goal, goal in the sense that if I set myself a goal that in my mentoring programs I run, if it is a goal for me to say I have to pair uh, the gender, same gender, then I won't be successful. So that is something with the current numbers we have, it's impossible. Um, so so that would be an achievable goal. Uh, but that's interesting that people are gravitating. In that mm -hmm. self selecting out even mm -hmm. even in a programming like uh, you know environment so maybe i was i was just thinking uh, it might be uh, this is complete speculation and that's why i wanted to know how you people uh, you know who are who are actually in, in open source contributors uh, feel about uh, is it just easier and there is less baggage to have to explain like i'd wonder if men would feel like if they give feedback to women they will have to explain more. And if this is kind of a pushback against, you know, that toxicity and hostility exists, so they are just like, I don't want to deal with it. I don't know if this is any kind of a negative or backlash that is happening that is just easier to not work with across the aisle because there's so much of baggage that might be involved. Do you have a, would you, if you were to do a follow on survey on this particular aspect, would that give you more results, fine-grained results on why is this the case? I think so. I think it would be useful because, again, you know, what, I, what um, just our mining archives, right? It gives you the what's, but not the why's or what's the context. So a survey or a um, survey is probably better. Interviews might be just harder to reach this. Mm -hmm. So having a survey would definitely be helpful. Angela, you joined. Do you have? Do you wanna uh, unmute and ask a question? I did. I'm so sorry about that. Um, no yeah, you know, my I'm not a contributor, but I have a sort of a front row view at this. You know, one of the things that I wonder about, I don't know the answer, but the time commitment. Obviously, open source contribution already is a big time commitment, and I think that there's 
the women that are already contributors have a vested interest. They understand that the diversity problem exists, that there needs to be more. I do feel like on the men's side, it's, it's kind of a, a split between, oh, it's not as much my problem. Someone else will sort it out. I don't have the time. And so what I wonder about is how can you, what's the incentive? How do we convince more men of the incentive? Because the, the small number of women that are currently contributors, there's absolutely no way we're going to change the numbers if the men aren't doing it, like you said. Exactly. And, and the time when there was cross-gender, more women were doing top-down to men, yep. right? So, so women are more cross-gendering than, <laughs> than the men are. So, yeah. So, Angela, that like is, is a perfect segue to, to my next question that I want to brainstorm with you all is, you know, how can we acknowledge implicit mentoring and not just, hey, thanks. And I, I won't name names, but one of my interviewees was like, you know, they spent a lot of time mentoring someone who was not a junior level person, but not a contributor. They spent a lot of time mentoring. And, you know, that person is thankful to this mentor, but it never got actually acknowledged. Like when the patch was in, there was no actual a trace of of the mentoring the amount of work that went in like in the channel when i was following you know it's just easier to have a video conference it's easier to meet in person do email like all the side mentoring that goes on and that's not even visible like there might be so much other kinds of implicit mentoring or informal mentoring that we are missing so how can we actually acknowledge these things because the more we can formally acknowledge give kudos you know it will really help them in retaining and avoiding some uh, burnout. One of the other, uh, another project I was working and the interviews had showed that um, more women like, you know, like in that interview said, more women like to do mentoring. That was like the more informal um, uh, engaged uh, relationship. But the more they did that, the less time they had to do technical contributions. And this uh, person said like, you know, now I have lost my engineering voice at the table because I haven't seen as a community manager and not as the engineer, right? So mm -hmm. what can we that do is... to acknowledge all this mentoring? So uh, for technical uh, contributions, right? We do have a path in uh, kernel that suggested by um, type tags that give credit to the person that came up with the idea. So maybe maybe the, if if other projects do not have that, it might be a good thing to take from the cardinal community. And most people are very good about acknowledging someone it's somebody's contribution in either, either it could be a bug reporting or help in debugging or such um, a idea on how to fix the problem. Uh, having said that, yes, a lot, uh, that is definitely a problem that when you are in the role of a community manager or mentoring and you can, you have, you do not have as much time to actually contribute, as a result, you do lose voice. So that is a real problem. So that's one of the reasons probably why a lot of people gravitate towards just doing um, what we all have fun doing. Personally, I. I need breaks to code. So as a mental sanity uh, breaks. So we, that's what we are, right, in, as engineers. So that is, there is a problem. I don't know what would be a, uh, what would be a good way to, um, good way to incentivize this. I'm open for ideas. Okay, I think. We are unfortunately uh, just about, I think, at time here. Okay. <laughs> so the other one is like, this is like, uh, I'm happy to have more discussions, but this is uh, brainstorming for all of you, like yeah. in how to acknowledge this invisible so, work so that formally and what other invisible work we might even be missing. Right. And so I'd encourage people to put their ideas in the chat as they think about these things as the talk's going forward. And just let's start, you know, brainstorming in the chat. And then we can sort of work from, you know, work from there and try to pull some of this together towards the end as well. So we're taking mm -hmm. into something, some ideas to make concrete. Thank you to okay. my interviewees, my team, and also Linux Foundation for actually inviting me. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Okay, I'm going to take the presenter back and queue up our next presentation. Okay. 
And I'll turn it over to Daniel. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Just a second, I'll give you presenter mode. There you go. You should be able to see the back and forth now. Uh, There should be arrows at the bottom of the screen for you. And I see your cursor moving now. So, okay, great. So I don't see what you see. So I just assume that. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. So <laughs> but yes, this is, this is a slide, right? So this is a slide we're presenting. Yes. The, the do do you want to start the presentation then, then I'll take over from you? I've already made, given it to you. Oh, sorry. You have you no, know, what I mean is, do you want to actually yeah. start with the first slides and then I'll okay, take over? Okay, sure. We'll just move it to the first slide rather than give me back presentation. Okay. Okay. So just to give everyone a bit of background here, um, two of myself and Daniel have been meeting and discussing these types of topics for quite a while now, uh, for over the last year. And one of the um, trend points we're sort of seeing is the kernel maintainers are not scaling, and it's a known concern. But you know, how do we start looking at trying to understand to improve the diversity of the maintainers participating and you know can we improve the situation the other you know challenges you know what are the incentives and these are the themes that you've been hearing um, throughout the rest of the other talks too for developers from diverse communities to participate in on an ongoing basis and retention so you know we're basically thinking that the if we can increase the uh, potential of long-term participants we're going to be improving the situation but the hows are what we're all interested in trying to come up with ideas to accomplish so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Daniel. Okay, so uh, my goal is to uh, present some uh, numbers and some trends with respect to um, participants. And uh, so let me talk a little bit about the methodology um, so you can have the context in which we're extracting this data. Um, we have been maintaining um, the Craigit uh, repository for uh, the Linux Foundation for the last five years. And um, that is the website where you can go and inspect um, the current source code of, of the kernel and see who's responsible for um, what contributions. We do it at the token level, so you, it's essentially a blame uh, by token. And uh, we also use this data for the Linux report that was published uh, late last year. And um, so we have been tracking uh, the kernel for the last uh, five years, uh, essentially. And um, all of the data that I'm going to present comes from uh, the Git repository. Uh, we're not using the mailing list, that's still a very rich uh, set of information. So we're just focusing on the people who are putting commits into uh, the kernel. Um, so part of this uh, work requires to identify uh, people from the email addresses. So we have been um, uh, what we call unifying uh, email addresses, and so from the 33,000 uh, 33, emails that we have, uh, we have identified almost 22,000 different uh, unique contributors. Uh, we have been using a tool uh, developed by um, uh, Carnegie Mellon and uh, to classify uh, gender. The tool is not perfect. Uh, it does um, a relatively decent approach. Uh, we do some verification. We have been doing it every release. Um, uh, for the last three years, uh, we go into the new um, the new contributors, which are usually between two and three hundred new people every uh, release, and we try to look at the names. And uh, in many cases, uh, we search for um, their names, and uh, we find some extra information, so we're able to classify them in terms of uh, the gender. And uh, unfortunately, um, as more as more people come from Asia. And it has become a little bit more difficult. So um, there's a significant number of people who we're not able to classify. Uh, we're talking about maybe 10% uh, in every single one of these um, new releases. So that has become a little bit of a threat to validity. And uh, <clears throat> having said that, so um, this is the basic uh, trend of the kernel. Um, each one of these bars represents a uh, release of the kernel. And, uh, and the horizontal axis is um, the, the date. As you can see, uh, and this is probably not a surprise, uh, the number of contributors to the kernels keeps, keeps increasing. And uh, the size of the kernel also keeps increasing. 
and um, in in blue we have the total number of contributors and um, and I uh, separated the number of contributors who are women so uh, the red corresponds to the proportion of all of them uh, that they are women so uh, as you can see so we have around 2100 contributors contributing to sorry uh, 5 per 14 is slightly less than 2000 and another of those, then we have around 150 uh, women who participated. And uh, so let me actually go into um, a little bit more specific numbers words so that they are easier to read. <clears throat> uh, just a, just so a this, oh, sorry, yeah, Daniel. Uh, there was a question in the chat saying, um, I'm wondering if only looking at the Git repository is not underrepresenting some people. You can be very active in discussions, but end up only in a few commits. Absolutely. And um, our goal is to try to understand trends. So we perceive that the repository, the, the, Git, the Git repository give, will give us trends. It will not give us the absolute number, so we will not know the number of people that do. But the same way that there are probably contributors who are uh, uh, women, uh, there are probably contributors who are uh, uh, non-binary and uh, and men in the uh, in the middle list that they're not part of the repository. So maybe the absolute numbers are um, skewed, but proportionally they uh, they're probably similar. And uh, so the trend of validity is a little bit lower uh, in that sense. So hopefully that kind of addresses uh, the question. Um, as with everything, uh, there will always be so. Uh, I always say that uh, in the work that we do, it's more like archaeology. We don't really know for sure what happened. We're trying to understand from the remnants that we have what might have happened. So that will always be um, a challenge. So for example, we don't really know what are the commits that never make it into the kernel and uh, because we don't have that data. So maybe some people try very, very hard for, for days, weeks to to uh, to contribute and they failed and uh, so uh, but we cannot see that so uh, this is this is the effort that we do with the data that we have um this this plot in particular is uh the proportion of women have contributed to uh, commits so uh, the left hand side is the absolute number uh so from zero to 180 and the right hand side is the proportion with respect to the total uh, of the kernel um, as you can see, these curves are, uh, at the ones I will show next, uh, they're almost the same. Uh, they have almost the same slope. They go up and down because of the variability between one release and the next release. And uh, notice also that um, the fact that a commit arrives in a release doesn't mean that the commit was made during the, 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 the three months period of that release. The commit might have been done a long time before, but the latency of, of, of the development meant that it arrived at that, that point. So as we can see here, uh, the proportion goes a little bit of, uh, more than uh, 8%. So it's very, very healthy. So with respect to numbers that we know um, 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 uh, uh, from the literature, the research literature with respect to the number of women contributing to open source projects, the kernel is exceptional. Um, it has a relatively large number of contributors who are women. So I think that in that sense, then uh, we can we can see that there's certain success on that. Um, these are commits authored by women, and uh, so the previous one was just the absolute numbers. Uh, this has to do more with the number of commits. Measuring commits is always a tricky um, uh, uh, task because not all commits are created equal. And uh, so I don't want to say that this actually measures the amount of work that they have done. It just gives us a slightly different view uh, with respect to the system. Now, I think that um, in terms of micro, micro uh, view of the world, every community is significantly different than other. Uh, when we aggregate them, we can probably uh, make some conclusions that might have uh, less of a threat to validity than others. Um, as you can see, the, the number of commits actually varies um, a little bit more. And, uh, and the, the left hand side again is the absolute number, but the absolute number doesn't really tell us anything. I think that it's more interesting to actually see uh, the proportion. You can see here that uh, in one release, it was uh, around 2000, it was almost uh, 10%, and, uh, but it fluctuates a little bit more. So it's relatively flat in the long term around here. Well, there's a little bit of an increase 
and uh, around here it depends on where you actually uh, yeah. create your boundary you can see that's horizontal you can see that's a slope you can read uh, a lot of conclusions from this graph so, so also is there is that potentially showing some of the impact of covid since women were authoring less and doing other things with their time uh potentially and we will never know and yeah. uh, uh unless we go and ask them we will really not have an idea we can make any so the problem is that we don't have causality we see the the, the, goes, uh, the the numbers going up and down, and uh, but we don't really know why that is the case. Uh, this is the one that uh, I find a little bit more interesting. So uh, this is the proportion uh, of of women who commit somebody else's code. And uh, so, um, as most of you know, in the kernel, most of the people do not. So sorry, let me start again. Uh, every commit has an author and a committer. Uh, in the kernel, most of most of the time, the committer is the maintainer that receives the patch uh, potentially via email and commits it into the kernel, so it gets in line to be merged eventually into the kernel. So the 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 field committer in a commit uh, kind of reflects who the person uh, responsible for um, for managing that commit is not the person who brought it. That's the author, the the, the data was shown before. But the person who is uh, maintaining that part of the kernel. Uh, this is where the numbers are uh, significantly lower. There's a lot of noise at the beginning because uh, uh, very few, uh, uh, very few uh, uh, people actually make uh, big jumps in proportion. But as you can see here, the proportion of, of women who have committed somebody else's code is just four percent. So we went from almost ten percent to um, less than four uh, percent in general, and it has remained relatively flat. Um, in the last few years, uh, it goes up and down a little bit, but this isn't just marginal. We're talking about eight people uh, to six people. And uh, so this is essentially just that noise of one person, maybe this uh, in this release contributes, maybe not. Um, this is, <clears throat> these are actually the number of commits. So the previous one is number of people. This is number of commits, and this is even lower. So uh, there are big spikes. And um, again, so it might actually have to do with the type of change. It might have been divided into many, uh, many different smaller commits. We don't, re uh, we don't really know until we look specifically at the data. But as you can see here, uh, the proportion of commits uh, uh, committed by women, um, it really hovers around um, 1% of the commits, 1%. So that's 10 times less uh, than, um, than the number of commits that they are done. So that actually uh, implies that there's a big imbalance in terms of uh, the proportion of women who are maintainers and um, versus the proportion of women who are uh, regular, uh, regular um, author contributors. Now, um, let me also mention that there's a little bit of latency because women join the kernel after um, uh, many men. So uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, so the first women joined the kernel um, many years after uh, uh, the kernel was developed. So uh, it takes time to be a maintainer. So many many of the women who are actually active now might become maintainers. So this will continue uh, growing up, but uh, we will have to see. Um, uh, this is something that I, that I really uh, I really got curious. So we were able to also look at uh, mentees. Uh, we have been able to identify 48 people who have been mentees of different programs. Some of these programs are old, and uh, they uh, they non um, um, uh people. Some of them are um, the outreach program for women. Some of them are the Linux Foundation mentorship. So um, we have identified 48 uh, in total. Two of them have not contributed a commit. Maybe they had other contributions, but as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, this talk, um, we're concentrating just in looking into the commits. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that uh, there are some people who have contributed just marginally. We're talking about, uh, so uh, this column, commits author, is the number of commits that they have contributed. So some people have just one commit. Uh, three commits, and, uh, and there are some people who have, uh, in this case, the maximum is 354 uh, commits. Um, this includes not the time where they were uh, mentees. Um, uh, it includes anything that they have contributed and uh, since the beginning of time. Uh, 
potentially some of these might have been mentees after they started contributing. And, uh, but it's clear that uh, many of them have contributed after. And uh, I think that the numbers are a little bit um, um, uh, in the sad side, uh, if you ask me. And uh, because these are people who um, the community have invested a lot into them. Uh, they were paid um, a, a salary to do these changes. And, uh, but as we can see, the, the, the number of contributions they have is, is relatively poor, even though some of them have been around for uh, a very long time. Um, none of them have ever taken the role of maintainer. And um, it's also important, and, and, I, and I put it here, this is the number of days between the first and the last contribution. So uh, some of them have been around for a very, very long time. And, uh, but I also wanted to include the number of days since the last contribution. So when was the last time that we see a change from them? Uh, the median is not very good. So uh, it's more than a year uh, that, uh, that since we saw uh, a commit from, um, from uh, any of these uh, mentees. So it's an interesting question because if the mentees are not becoming long-term contributors, uh, is it worth the investment that is placed on this specific set of people? Perhaps it will be more interesting to actually look at some other informal uh, methods of, of mentorship, as Anita was mentioning. Daniel, uh, I, this do is basically, a, yeah, I do ahead. have a question. Is that okay? Um, yeah. So in the question, um, I, are you looking at these um, gender-based? Are you looking at these mentorships as just women? Uh, we uh, have the gender, but here we have all of them. So the uh, maintainer uh, information is incorrect if you are looking at, even, even if you are not looking at gender, because at least I know uh, two or three of mentees have become maintainers. So, so I know that um, for a fact. Mm -hmm. so, so remember that my, mesh, my metric is whether they have committed somebody else's code. Okay. I see. So, so you're not that's looking what, that's at what I, that's what I call maintainers in this context. Right. So he, um, that is not an accurate measure because there will be maintainers in the maintainers files um, that are. So, so, so perhaps we need a new term for this. And uh, so because this actually becomes a managerial role, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the maintainer uh, in the kernel, in the, in the maintainers file, is the person who's responsible for a particular part of the code. Uh, that potentially means that those people who are maintainers, they are not actually, they don't get help from somebody else into their same source code. And that's actually why they have not had to commit somebody else's code. But uh, the definition that I use and, uh, and uh, was that they had to commit somebody else's code. So uh, let well, me face that. So, what uh, I'm saying is, yeah, what I'm saying is that's not a good metric, especially when we are uh, making observations based on the information saying, well, um, is it is it for all these programs useful? So, just to keep that in mind. Yeah. So, so um, I will not use the term uh, then. I will just basically say they have not committed somebody else's, somebody else's code. Okay. And uh, but uh, yeah. So I, I think that they might actually be some people who uh, are there and they're maintaining that code, and uh, but the contributions are relatively small compared to the amount of time that they have been uh, contributing. So the big question, in my opinion, is. Uh, is it worth to have these programs that they don't scale because they're not going to scale in the long term? They're going to contribute a handful of people every single time rather than to think in terms of programs that might actually have a wider reach and be more effective in the long term. Right. Constantin um, brought up another good point that some maintainers um, some well, send pull requests to another maintainer. So in which case they won't show up as committers um, uh, on as a committer as opposed to. So what I'm saying is this, uh, the way that you are determining maintainers um, needs to be tweaked. Uh, so again, let's not use the term maintainer. All I'm saying is that they are not responsible for somebody else's uh, uh, commit. Well, that's not quite true also, right? Because when um, a sub-maintainer sends a pull request to a maintainer- Oh, in the, day, in the data that I have, in the data that I have. Okay. In the data that I have, they are not the ones responsible. So, so as I said before, there's a threat to validity that that's what we're observing only. They might actually be COVID somewhere else. And uh, what becomes interesting is the aggregation of the numbers, right? Uh, we will never know this, the precise story of each person individually. 
uh, there's a lot of interesting data that we don't have. And I think that what becomes interesting is to see the trend of the data overall. And, uh, but anyway, so uh, that's everything with respect to this. And I think, Shua, you are the one who want to present now with respect to uh, the next slide. Thank you, Daniel. Um, sorry, I was switching. I didn't realize. Okay, so uh, thanks. Um, so we have done a, done a survey of all of the candidates that applied for mentorship, Linux Foundation uh, mentorship, uh, this year. Uh, when we did the survey, one thing that came up came as a uh, a high point in that is that notable noteworthy point is applying. Um, they apply because we ask them what is is there a certain feature of this program that makes you apply or stand out one thing that uh, they called out is that uh, being able to work one-on-one -on -one with experts and maintainers in the community is the uh, big draw for them and then that's why they come and apply for these programs so so that's an interesting uh, thing about formal mentorship where you have uh, the exposure to the mentors and um, maintainers and then uh, developers and contributors in the community are taking the time to do either uh, explicit mentoring, working one on one with the uh, uh, mentee or implicit mentoring by helping them um, in the community through the patching process. So that's that's an interesting thing I wanted to mention that from that came up from the survey. So the, so the question then becomes, is it's valuable to the mentees. How do we get them to pay it forward? Correct. We want um, to right. right. Some of them do. Um, some of them um, are uh, doing that, but behind the scenes. Uh, I recently met a, one of my mentees and uh, she is uh, very active internally at the company she is working, um, starting mentoring programs. Um, internally mentoring um, at her company, but do do does she get time to mentor up, upstream is the question. So again, it goes back to what do the employers that the employers once they hire them, where do they want them to focus on? That also shows in the upstream contributions as well. Do they get uh, time and uh, time? and encouragement or responsibilities to do work upstream. Yeah, I, I think that in that sense, the, the mentoring programs have been extremely successful. They are able, for the, from the point of view of the mentee, they are able to, create, to start a career. And I see it uh, when I search for their names. Uh, they're working in companies where they're doing uh, software development, in many cases, uh, open source software development companies. And I think the challenge is uh, the other side of the question. So how to make it worthwhile for the kernel to be their, uh, their um, uh, mentors. And uh, because it takes, it takes time and effort to do that. And, uh, and if the person is not going to contribute after the, the mentorship is over, then it's a loss for uh, the kernel of the, all, that, all that investment. In my opinion, you have to kind of look at it a little bit bigger than just kernel. I would say that you are um, um, making a difference and you are showing them that, hey, this is your career path. And they might at some point come back to contribute to the kernel. So they are contributing to the kernel indirectly at their companies. So they are still part of the ecosystem, right? Linux, kernel, Linux ecosystem. So it's, it's a no, different- Not all of them. Right. And, but the, the, the biggest challenge is that that doesn't scale, right? So in terms of trying to scale it and trying to attract more people to really change the, the trends, that will not scale. I think that's, that's what I see as the, as, as the challenge. I agree. We are providing, we are providing resources, we are providing training and what individuals do with it is not in our control. So 
um, it, without this, would we even see uh, them be exposed to this? They will not even have an exposure to it. It's awareness, exposure, right? That's we're mm -hmm. talking about. We're also talking about how oddly do we expose them to? Do we say, do we need to go back to uh, high schools and um, because when they are starting out, they'll find it, this awareness makes a huge difference. So, uh, so what is the field will be without this? Um, you are looking at what is the measure with these programs in place, but I would ask the question, what would the landscape look like without this? Right. I think that uh, we're seeing the same. I think that the difference is that I see it as what is the benefit for the open source project of the mentor? You have to ask the mentors. For me, yeah. uh, just working with them, collaborating, <laughs> and you. sharing my knowledge is, is what is. I think we are, um, Katie's saying, we're out of time, getting. Uh, no, we're, we're not out of time, but I'm just sort of thinking if we've got a few other people here. Right, in, there are a couple of like, Yeah, who might want so to. So, Lauren has some comments. Hey, Lauren, do you want to um, ask? Unmute and ask. Do you want to? Uh, well, we have this. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, we've lost one of the people I was expecting. But anyhow, so um, I think we're aiming pretty much towards the problem that the kernel maintainers aren't scaling as a known concern, and a lot of them spend the time doing the mentoring. Um, and so, you know, how can we, do people have ideas on how we can expand the diversity of maintainers uh, participating? Um, you know, what rewards are going to, you know, motivate more developers to volunteer either as mentors or as um, maintainers. You know, I think we've sort of touched a little bit on the best practices, um, but, you know, obviously we want to be keeping that kernel quality over time. And so I'm just sort of looking in the chat or if there, anyone wants to turn the camera on or un mic unmute and start. Um, you know, share thoughts, that'd be welcome. Okay, hi, Deval. Thanks. So, so here's, here's a question, right? Now, mm -hmm. we're talking about getting more maintainers in. At this point in time, does, is mentorship limited to just getting new developers in or mentoring contributors who, who may not be at a maintainer level, but yeah. could be coached there? I, like I say, this is one of the ideas I'm wondering is do we need to basically have a mentoring program for potential maintainers for developers who are already in the kernel? Uh, so we've really been talking about new, you know, all our mentoring programs to date are only focused on new um, contributors from what I can tell. I think it's inf there's some inform informal mentoring that's going on, but I think she was in a better position to comment that, on that than me. So one thing that um, I am trying to do is next year is uh, starting expand uh, having uh, maintainer um, focus uh, training for maintainers or de developers that are wanting to become maintainers, uh, having a maintainer series um, and subsystem specific series so uh, they can come in and, and in the LF live webinar. So we don't have a it is currently a mentorship formal mentorship is uh, really focused on bringing new developers diverse uh, diversity increasing diversity in the community that's so the one area that i'm looking at is informal mentoring part of it the webinar series adding maintainer component to it There's anything else in the chat? Um, uh, Rohak has a comment on uh, read more maintainers in a corporate environment. There may be extra hurdles to become a maintainer, like you are not senior enough internally, so you can't become a responsible externally. Um, so yeah, there's uh, since most 
what was the what's the number of people that like what was the percentage again um people that are working or rough approximation i think it's you know pretty close most of them are working for companies and that may be a barrier but i'm taking on more maintainers because they're perceived they can't be they're getting blocked in their own companies do others see that Val's basically commenting. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's go on to the next set of questions and see if other people have thoughts on these. Thanks, Daniel. Um, one of the open questions we've had is, you know, how are we going to start looking at creating incentives for developers from diverse communities to participate in an ongoing basis? You know, is there ways we can get them to be engaging beyond their day jobs? You know, how do we make it fun satisfying? What should be tried next? Are there any thoughts that are coming in there? Hmm. Uh. So um it, you know like we're hearing ajd's basically commenting it can be hard to persuade management to fund personal personnel for a role that is not as easily tied to revenue yeah i think we've all seen that we've all seen that pushback like luckily there's a few you know there's several enlightened companies that you know recognize that they do need to you know work on wider tasks and some that's in their interest okay um <laughs> and uh, we get a quote can be it's um coming in the chat so i'm assuming that means um <laughs> usually is okay good mm -hmm. And then Jonathan's coming, not always. But anyhow, so it looks like we've got a variety of different opinions. Um, it's not universal, um, but it may be a factor. However, there does seem to be people definitely agreeing that management, allowing management to carve out time for these types of things is something we should, be, would help possibly. Okay. Uh, anyone have ideas on what we should be trying next? beyond reaching out to the management um, of the companies and try to, you know, see if we can get some sort of recognition program going. Feel free to, you know, just unmute and start talking if you want to comment on any of these. This is, you know, to be a discussion. Hey, it's Angela. I have a, a quick one on this one. So the yeah. open source jobs report just came out. I was glancing at it a couple days ago and obviously we have a lot of jobs that are going to need to be filled. So I think there's an argument to be made that it is in the companies, the organizations that are uh, involved in open source and, and you know, uh, employing a lot of open source uh, contributors and maintainers, there's an incentive for them to help fill the pipeline. And that regardless of how they feel about diversity initiatives, the fact is we need more people. And mm -hmm. so if we can figure out ways to uh, incentivize the companies that this is in their own best interest from the perspective of they're going to need people to fill these jobs that would allow people in the companies to have the time to commit to, I know it's not that easy, but that's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, that's good. So I, I think that we are observing already a little bit of that. Uh, a large proportion of women that we observe come from corporate um, email addresses and uh, so they are being hired by the companies and they're they're put to work on the kernel as their responsibility um, I think that the number of so the the, the a, a very important question is what is the size of the potential pool of women developers that we can have as of now in general, in the world, in the United States, in Canada. 
And of, the, of that, then how is the kernel doing? Because perhaps already 10% is starting to achieve a little bit of that balance between the number that is available out there and, uh, and the number who work in the kernel. And perhaps our goal is actually to make it twice that. And, uh, but maybe even if we try very, very hard, uh, there will be a certain point in which we will not be able to find uh, more women to participate. Um, I also think that the key is to understand incentives and uh, what are the incentives of the different participants? What are the incentives of the Intels, the Red Hats, uh, the, the, the Linaros to, um, to contribute to that uh, balance? And what is the incentive of the different people to uh, contribute, the individuals uh, themselves? So I think that we need to understand a little bit more motivations and, uh, that people have, that uh, organizations have, and uh, to be able to essentially enact policies that um, help um, satisfy those motivations. I'm wondering, Angela, is, you know, in some of the interactions on the various diversity initiatives and so forth, is there any ties in that are emerging? Um, I mean, obviously, the, the, the mentorship opportunities, whether implicit or explicit, are definitely mm -hmm. increasing. I am starting to see, um, I mean, to be quite frank, the communities that are, that have been around a lot longer, the projects that have been around a lot longer, have still have the smallest uh, amount of diversity. And it's, I think it's been a bit more impenetrable, whereas the younger projects uh, have frankly a younger generation of contributors and then you start to see more diversity there. Um, we do have a lot more women that are participating in events, which, you know, I'll go over what you tend to see is, uh, they err towards more of the soft topics, the so-called soft topics, because I do think, and this goes back to the survey results that Shua showed, um, you know, with the mentor, with the mentorship program, one of the top things people want or like about that explicit mentorship program is the ability to experiment and learn how to contribute effectively. You don't really get to do that if you don't have someone show you the ropes um, without being potentially subjected to people, you know, ripping apart your code, telling you you don't know what you're doing. And I think that's kind of why we see sort of a, a shyness on approaching that without someone kind of helping you to learn those ropes or, or lift you up. Um, we're seeing more women and we're seeing more diversity, but it is, it's slow. I mean, as you know, and I think one of the, I think there is a lot of, there, the, the, the potential is endless. I mean, there are, you know, half of the uh, population are roughly as women. So to me, if the incentives were right, if other, uh, diverse groups felt welcome, there's no reason it shouldn't be able to be more of a 50 50, but obviously that is a long road to get there and requires a lot of people um, understanding that that's in the best interest of open source to happen. Mm -hmm. Constantine's um, first camera on. You, wanna, you got comments here? Yeah, I was going to, I think Veronica mentioned it in the, um, in the chat already that I've actually haven't written any code or done any open source work outside of my day job in the evenings or anything like that simply because you know families and then i'm just not interested in doing this because this is part of my day job and i think i'm not sure we should be approaching this from the perspective of let's how, how can we as a community promote more you know women maintainers and i think we should be working more with uh with member companies uh, with major uh contributors to the, to the linux kernel saying you know how can we help you promote more women who we already employ, who are already working for you to become uh, successful maintainers of the kernel or any other number of uh, open source projects. I think that would be a better approach than try to find volunteers who probably are not interested in becoming maintainers because maintaining anything in the kernel is a full-time job. It's not something that you can do, you know, in a spare hour here or there. That's just, <clears throat> that's just not going to scale. You, Constantine nailed two things there that I find interesting. One, I remember, you know, uh, first kind of starting to work on the events in 2008, 9, and 
almost everyone that was at Plumbers Conference, Colonel Summit, these events, they were single or perhaps newly married. There were very few that had children. So you come forward to now and family obligations that weren't there before are take much more precedence uh, in terms of people's time. The other one that I think he brings up that is an important one to look at is what I find frightening, and I think I'm sure everyone does, is we have a ton of women, a ton is not a good one, but a lot of women that come in that then turn around and leave. So in terms of, to Constantine's point, I'd argue perhaps trying to figure out a way to keep the people, keep the folks that run, you know, are in that diverse group, keep them from leaving versus trying to go out and find new ones is perhaps the lowest hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Well, I think also on that note, I think we're sort of at time for this section. So why don't I basically turn it over to you now to go through what you've been seeing with everyone else? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. And thank you, Constantine, for joining in. And thank you, Shua. Let's go with that and pull yours up. Okay. You might have to show me where yep. present or mode is if I don't. Uh, no, I, I'm giving, I'll give it to you as soon as I've got your one queued up okay. for you, okay? And there we go. There, and um, and you should now be a presenter. I see this, okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Angela Brown with the Linux Foundation and my talk is really gonna be about the trends the impacts and trends that we see around uh, diversity and events and sort of this relationship uh, that I see between the two of them. So purposes of, for the purposes of this talk, you're gonna see that I'm focusing primarily on gender because frankly, it's the thing that we've been tracking the longest, um, a little bit on race and geographic diversity. There are many different kinds of diversity and I don't mean to leave anything out, but I just wanna put that disclaimer out there. So we've talked about what diversity looks like in open source and the kernel community, et cetera. Now we're gonna look at open source events. And to be really frank, there is no difference because events are a direct representative of their communities. So what you know, we do, uh, my team does probably 40 conferences a year. Um, we do conferences that are, you know, a kernel summit or an LSF MM summit where it's a very small group of invite only, you know, core kernel developers all the way to very large conferences like KubeCon, um, which might have 12,000 people. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of different uh, technical project areas as well as sort of these uh, soft uh, topics um, that I was referring to earlier. And what we see is that the communities that have less diversity equal events that have less diversity. Um, and I think that really is kind of, there's a, a, a challenge on both ends there, right? So an event is really in a way like a physical manifestation of a community that exists 24 seven, 365. And so it can be this very visceral way to see just how good your diversity is or just how uh, bad uh, it is. And I think for folks that might, especially in this day and age when things are on social media and even like the attendees that are there that might be from a diverse background, if they don't see themselves well represented, they might not feel like they can go back. These are just kind of a few quotes that I found online from things that I think kind of represent this. Um, this first one, I feel like it's a circle I can't get into, but mostly I fear the excessive spotlight of being a sole female programmer on a publicly available project. I, I, I think that's a very understandable uh, feeling. And so, you know, when we move on to sort of these different kinds of projects where you have more diversity, it's going to encourage more diversity. An example of a project that I would say has decent relative diversity um, on the maintainer front is uh, some of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation projects. They are younger, right? So there wasn't sort of this established club that felt impenetrable. And there were some women that were early maintainers on that project. And that has then in turn made other women feel like they can be um, maintainers or contributors and they're not gonna be the only woman in the room. And I think that's really important. Um, and it reflects then on the events too. So this is a look, this is from 2019, the last year we had in-person events. 
Um, and this is a sort of random sampling of events that we um, produced in 2019. And so one of the other things that I really want to focus on in terms of the events uh, is that speakers tend to be very representative of the attendees. So the point being that people want to see themselves represented, right? And if we're talking about someone that's considering whether they belong uh, in a community, belong at an event, they're going to look at who is speaking at that event to feel, to, to try and discern if, if if they belong there. And I think that you'll see this sort of reflection here in these numbers where the number of women and non-binary speakers at an event tends to correlate pretty closely to the number of uh, attendees. There is a caveat here I want to mention, which is KubeCon, because it is sort of a, a blatant example here where the numbers are very different. And I just used the example of CNCF. Um, speakers don't just naturally like diversity in my opinion doesn't just naturally come um, with speakers it's something that every community if diversity is important to them and they have events needs to work hard at this point in time and historically to get more representation on stage um, cncf does take that seriously but they've had really this sort of blind um, review process uh, amongst a group of almost 100 program committee members um, that really focuses on picking the best content over potentially looking at some other factors like diversity. Whereas to be quite frank, for most of the Linux Foundation events, we do a combination. We obviously want the best content, but we are also actively trying to ensure that we have a good representation or the representation that we want to see on stage. KubeCon is, CNCF is actually looking at kind of addressing this right now and doing a new process moving forward because as you can see with the number of speakers versus number of attendees on the kubecon events they don't really have that same correlation that we see um, on the other um, events and what i sort of when i say like there's a lot of outreach that happens we kind of work to make sure this happens and i brought up social media i mean we are in a world where whatever happens at an event does kind of have this sort of like uh, exponential um, sharing across you know, the globe. And so when we look at events where we purposefully ensure that we have diversity or any event where you have diversity, you end up with things like this, where someone you know, came and had an exceptional experience at the event, turned around, put it on social media, and to me, I look at this and I say, okay, now someone that looks like Samson is going to say, hey, I belong at this event. I can speak at this event. I can attend this event. Someone that looks like Kamadri is going to say the same thing. And so the overarching point there is that sort of the speakers, more diverse speakers are going to bring more diverse attendees. This is a recent keynote lineup from the cloud, um, sorry, the Continuous Delivery Foundation. This did not happen accidentally. Like, this was a very purposeful uh, keynote lineup that took a lot of outreach. And I think there's a few factors that we've kind of addressed here before. With a lot less women in the community, frankly, what starts to happen um, in sort of the beginning stages of a community deciding, hey, we really need to have, you know, presentation of diversity on stage, you start to get, frankly, the sort of like, who are the women I know? So let's say i'm going to use an, an example let's use the kernel communities so if we were doing a you know a kernel conference like to be quite frank there are three or four women like off the top of my head that come to mind there aren't a hundred right and there are that many but the problem is is sort of the the folks that tend to be most known that have the diverse backgrounds tend to get called upon to speak a lot and i think there's sort of this uh, balance of, you know, when we talked about earlier, if you're a kernel developer and you're a woman and you're already working a full-time do job doing that and you have a family and now you're being called on to be the diversity representative on 10 different panels in a year, how are you supposed to actually get your work done? So I think you have this kind of this stressful point where you're trying to decide like what's good for a more diverse community, but like I need to worry about my own personal career and, and you know, family, et cetera. And so I think 
the more speakers that we can find, the more diversity that's in um, the community, the more we're going to kind of see this uh, circling around to this. So I deal with a lot of different communities and still we have several communities. They tend to be, to be quite honest, you know, again, ones that have been around longer, the embedded space has a lot less, you know, um, diversity, uh, especially gender diversity uh, versus like the cloud native community. But, you know, one of the things that we say to all of our projects is no all man or all male keynote and speaking lineups, no manals, right? No all male panels, no, you can't have all men on a stage for your entire schedule. And some of them come to me and say, well, we just don't have a lot of women in the community. <laughs> so we don't have women speakers because there aren't a lot of women in the community, sort of this, it's not my fault. Um, but the thing is, is like, it's just going to be a, a feedback loop and a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You can keep saying that, but nothing's going to change. And ultimately, I think for the one to two women, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific example in my head when I'm using this one, for the few women that are in that community, you're putting an unnecessary pressure on them that frankly isn't fair. The community, the leaders in the community, I feel like it's partly their responsibility to help ensure that for frankly, the longevity of the project and sustainability that you are uh, working on getting more diversity in there. You get more diversity in the community, you put more diversity on stage, you're gonna have a more diverse set of attendees, which in turn means that you have a more diverse community and so on and so forth. I think geographic diversity kind of flipping entirely, we are doing much better at, um, you know, this is a, a graph from the GitHub state of the Octoverse report in 2019. Um, as you can see, there's, uh, you know, China and India, um, definitely leading the charge in terms of the top regions outside the U S uh, by open source use from this report. We ourselves in 2019 at in-person events, had attendees from 108 countries, um, which is which we were very happy about. We also work to be, you know, to get more people from a geographic um, diversity background through holding events in different countries as well. And so I think that's one thing to be mindful of is, you know, trying to meet your audience where they are uh, as well. I mean, even in, when we do conferences, for example, in North America, one of the things we try to do is move, uh, the conferences around. And the reason that we started doing that versus simply holding it in the same city every year, which would have been easier was to make it easier from like a socioeconomic perspective, right. Um, for some people. So there wasn't sort of like, you know, if we held it in the Bay area every year, the San Francisco people didn't always have the benefit that the conference was right there. So I think, you know, being 2021 and the fact that we've been stuck in COVID for a year and a half, one big one right now is did virtual events help diversity? Um, I'm going to go through kind of a couple different areas. The it's hard to say, uh, frankly, is the answer on gender diversity. I've got two different conference comparisons here. So first we're looking at KubeCon 2018 KubeCon was in person. 2019 was in person. 2020 was virtual and this year, the conference is in three weeks, it's hybrid in person and virtual. And you'll see that the numbers don't change a ton. There is a little bit of a drop for virtual here. Um, and then if you look at open source summit, which again is following the same pattern, you again, see a little bit of a drop here for 2020. I think Kate kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say entirely. I don't think we have enough data, but I would argue that um, of the women who were perhaps, you know, uh, mothers, uh, COVID put sort of a, a larger burden on them from the parenting perspective um, with kids being at home and everything. Um, but other than that, that's kind of the only point we have. So we don't really have much to go off of. The flip side of that that I find interesting is that we also took a look at KVM Forum and Plumbers Conference, and they've actually had slightly higher virtual uh, attendance than they have in person. So again, just kind of hard to say, but an interesting, you know, it'll be kind of interesting to see as we go back to in person fully, how that changes. 
For the geographic desert, uh, diversity, absolutely. So we talked about the number of attendees we had for all conferences overall in 2019 was 108. KubeCon alone, which these two um, uh, graphics represent, uh, KubeCon North America. In 2019, we had six people from 67 countries. 2020 for virtual 137 countries. So obviously from a geographic perspective, this helps a ton. For racial diversity, we frankly don't have enough data yet. We only started tracking um, racial uh, diversity specifically in our event registration forms. We have optional questions for different areas of diversity so that we can try to get data to understand what's working and what's not. Um, and we only added this in 2020. Um, I didn't put the breakdown um, after a uh, person of color, but you'll see that for the virtual event, 20, uh, you know, just over 20% for Open Source Summit ELC. For the hybrid event that we're getting ready to do, it's dropped. Um, but for KubeCon, it's roughly the same. Again, having no fully in-person data yet to look at, it's just really hard to tell. So this has been, up, been brought up a couple times, but I want to talk about diversity and inclusion initiatives at events. From our perspective, this has been something that has been critical in kind of increasing the numbers of, of diverse uh, folks that we have at our events. Um, starting with an event code of conduct that we strictly enforce, starting with not allowing you know, all male uh, schedules, panels, keynote lineups, we do a ton of scholarship and diversity travel funding. Um, we offer resources for parents on site, childcare, nursing rooms, et cetera. Um, we do a ton of active outreach to women and other underrepresented groups to speak. I'm not gonna go through the entire list, but the point is that I feel like the events where we really do a lot of these efforts, we do end up having um, a lot more in terms of uh, attendee diversity. Um, coming up to like the 20 to 25% of attendees when you look at an event like Open Source Summit Embedded Linux Conference, um, which is frankly high for an open source conference. And so I think the point on that is just, you have to put the effort in, but I believe that when you put the effort in on the events, it's going to reflect very publicly and you know, word of mouth and social media, and, and then that is in turn going to help your community. Um, this is just an interesting trend line I wanted to point out that kind of uh, shows the amount of work that goes into this. So when we did the first LinuxCon in 2000, sorry, it was not the first, I think it was the second, LinuxCon in 2010, 10% of our speakers were women. And my old boss, Amanda McPherson, who was an early diversity advocate, she worked on getting uh, you know, women uh, into that programming, but still 10%. 2019, nine years later, 23% of our speakers are women and non-binary. This year in 2021 for the conference next week, 27.8% uh, of speakers. And we have worked hard at this. And I think that's kind of you know, the overarching point. It takes a ton of time just like we've talked about before like mentorship takes a ton of time how do we provide those incentives we are incentivized to do this i have the time to put in to doing this um but these kind of this kind of sort of slow uphill battle uh i think we all understand that this is happening across the board uh just another sort of point on this one for that diversity um in 2019 we did over we donated over a, you know spent uh, over $900,000 in travel funding across the organization with over 700K of that going to diverse candidates. So we were able to fund 638 individuals from uh, all sorts of diver uh, diversity areas. I will say that in that year, I think the largest singular group um, that those funds went to was from India um, with a focus obviously on you know women and people of color um, the need-based number you see here is primarily for socioeconomic diversity. Um, so again, these are very, just it's just a lot of work and effort that goes into kind of creating these more diverse events. Um, and then again, just to kind of quick look at that geodiversity, you can see that India, um, that was the number one group that the, for the breakdown on travel funding. But again, this is us trying to uh, increase that geographic diversity. 
So long story short, it is a slow uphill battle. It takes a ton of work. Um, I think obviously the big question here is how do we make sure that, you know, everybody, uh, companies, you know, uh, mentor or maintainers that are perhaps men, you know, events all across open source and tech in general, how do we kind of incentivize people to continue that slow uphill battle that ultimately does have big changes eventually. And this is actually an email I received about two weeks ago from someone internally that uh, I will be honest, made my heart swoon because this stuff is a lot of work. And if I'm being really, really honest, you know, I entered open source in 2007. I'd done tech events before. Diversity was never something we paid attention to. Um, and when we first started doing these things, I didn't get it. Like, I'm just gonna be really honest with you. I didn't get it. And then I started to get it. And the more that I put the work into it and saw that it was kind of starting to chip away and make these differences, the more I wanted to do these things. And I think that comes down to those incentives again. But this is an email from someone internally who was one of those, uh, you know, small group of women in the networking community who was consistently being asked when a lot of conferences started doing, you know, all no all male panels to be on a panel. And she basically says that, you know, I was on the third of three consecutive panels in which women were the majority, uh, you know, today. And the best part is we weren't even thinking about diversity. It just happened. And she's basically saying that the work we started years ago has kind of led to this. It is a very slow battle, but that's how positive change happens. And then we love seeing things like this, right? And this is kind of that, that sort of uh, feedback loop, right? We live in a very social world, social media world. Um, if, you, if you do things that show you care about diversity, people are going to share that then more people want to be part of your community because it's perceived as being diverse, so on and so forth. And so the idea here by overarching on this relationship between events and, uh, com and uh, the open source projects community is they really do affect each other in my, in my view um, and can both in a positive and a negative way. And then just a quick one on mentorships. I know we've covered this a bit. We try to use our events for sort of smaller speed mentorship opportunities. Um, we've seen those and other like purposeful small group interactions at events be really successful. Um, so I would highly encourage those for anything that you might be doing. Um, another example on that one is, you know, we have a women in open source lunch um, that we started in 2013, I think, for LinuxCon slash Open Source Summit ELC now. And what started as a group of 30 women is now 100, and non-binary attendees is now 150 plus. And it's been really amazing to watch that growth and, and the connections that are built there um, that kind of continue throughout the event and beyond. Last year, uh, working with Shua, uh, we launched an online mentorship sort of webinar series um, to kind of help provide, again, this, a bit of a one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, our goal was to sort of help kind of get these technical topics, uh, on a sort of one and a half hour session where there was a conference talk for part of it, similar to this, and then really a discussion. And we've had over 50, we've had over 5,300 people register for the 21 sessions we've done since October, 2020. We haven't measured anything yet here, but again, our hope is that some of those folks then join the LFX mentorship program or kind of continue to look at opportunities that are available. Um, and then for the LFX mentorship program, one of the things we're excited about is we're gonna be doing a mentee showcase in December um, that will really allow our mentees that have gone through the program to showcase their work. We're hoping again by that is maybe a way that we could actually profile and, and uh, kind of thank the mentors as well um, who helped contribute to that. And that kind of gets me to these final thoughts. Diversity begets diversity. Virtual events have a clear geographic impact. Event diversity and inclusion initiatives have an impact. Speaker diversity has an impact. Can't fix what you aren't tracking, so start tracking it. And all types of mentorship, in my opinion, that help to pull people in and up Thank you. And I'm sorry I went long. No, 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 we're all still on time and everything's good. Um, 
the I really like the idea of possibly coming up here of using the mentee showcase as a way of highlighting the mentors and giving them credit back. I think that's an awesome idea. Yeah, I just, I mean, when we were talking about it earlier, I don't think, Shua, that was something we had, I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but uh, Anita's bringing this up earlier. I think this is something that we need to look at is um, how we really kind of, uh, you know, address the hard work that these mentors are putting in. Um, and hopefully that helps us get more mentors. Right, absolutely. So that's one of the reasons. Um, and I wasn't sure, Angela, if we are ready to to talk about this, but yes, uh, thanks for mentioning the mentee showcase and uh, Angela and I have been working on this uh, for a few months now, uh, trying to get all the pieces in place. So um, yes, that is one way we can acknowledge mentors. And, and another thing is the peer recognition and we want to try to uh, acknowledge the contributions. And we have been doing that for the live webinar. We are giving out badges now, mentorship badges and so on. Um, as for a monetary and such, we won't be able to do that. But um, is there the peer recognition and then mentorship badges and acknowledging them at these uh, showcases and so on? That I, that is. I have a question do. actually, if I if from mm -hmm. the audience on the badging, um, because it, this is something you know, having this sort of achievement badge that you can put on on LinkedIn or online or on a resume. I mean, from the perspective of having helped someone complete a program like that, I would think it would actually look really good on a, on a resume, um, especially for like a leadership job, a manager job or something like that. But I'm intrigued to know what others think. Feel free to unmute and start talking or type in the chat, whichever is easiest if people have some thoughts here. I, I have a suggestion slash, I, I really love highlighting what the, uh, Sanita, sorry, I'm just trying to start my sharing. Hi, Anita. So, I, so I love the uh, the showcasing, the mentee showcasing that can also highlight the mentors. I think that's great. Uh, one of the things I've been um, kicking around, and I think Kate had mentioned this a couple of times to me, some kind of like badging or karma points, right? So things that accrue and that I can, if I'm a mentor and have been doing it, accrues that can be shown in the profile. I'm almost thinking like, you know, the way the GitHub profile has all those little green thingies, which is all code code or like the technical contributions. Maybe we can have some karma points or some kind of profiling that also shows this invisible work. For example, mentoring, like how many mentors have you, like for me as an academic advisor, if my, how many students have I graduated? How many students are faculty themselves? And you know, my grandchildren and children's grandchildren, right? So if you can show some kind of a networking of like, you know, the impact a mentor has had, that would be pretty good on a profile and would even maybe get to career improvements for people. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Is that something like, you know, that's been mentoring in the events and things like that we could yeah. <laughs> take credit for, et cetera. We could, yeah, definitely. Okay. No, that's okay. And I would love to talk more about how to highlight invisible work. That's my, the itch that I'm really itching to scratch. So I'm looking at all different ways to do that. Mm -hmm. and yeah. we're, we're with you on that one. I think that's the interesting thing about the, I was reading the, I think it was the 2017 GitHub survey and, you know, think that there are, I personally think that there's more diversity in kind of a lot of these hidden areas um, or a lot of really hard work being done in these hidden areas too that you don't see reflected on a GitHub because it's not just contribution based. Mm -hmm. And so I love this idea and it, and it, it, I think you need that. I mean, it just goes back to everything we've been kind of talking about here earlier, you know, you're going to put your efforts into, you know, a lot of people work for companies. The company wants to see that the work of these folks is, you know, like if they're hiring someone, like they want to see contributions. But I think if there's a way for them to see other value that that employee is bringing, that's huge. And, uh, and that's not reflected anywhere right now, as you said. Right. So I did some past work where I looked at what do hirers look at? And right now they are going for the cheap metrics, like just quantity and code metrics. 
but what they really want is more improved social skills and professional development skills but they can't right now identify that because these are harder skills to evaluate until you do the interview even then it's hard so we had been thinking about you know how can you look at the quality of the work than just the quantity and also non-code contribution kind of kind of works and uh, I had an idea and I completely forgot about it. <laughs> I'll bring it up later. Uh, yeah, so so I think it would be a um, useful metric uh, that others can look at. And talk, yes, talking about the company values you're talking about, there's a lot of work on inner sourcing now, basically advocating for open source values inside the company, as well as for advocating for diversity in open source, advocating for open source in general. And those things are completely, you know, not seen at all. So how to like pick those up, the advocacy that goes on, the community health advocacy that goes on into this, this kind of karma system. Yeah. I just want, before we run out of time, just wanted to, one of your questions, Anita, I think is uh, right in line from uh, for uh, Angela from the chat is, you know, moving forward post COVID, uh, would it be good to have a hybrid format be more, especially for those who can't afford time or money to travel to the conferences? I've yeah. also seen a couple comments about visas as well <laughs> in this one. Yeah, it's, it's um, which is another reason that we make sure we, move, we do events in more than one location. I've not personally been a fan of <clears throat> North America's uh, entry requirements for quite some time now. Um, yes, we will continue in some form to do uh, a virtual component of the in-person events. I think that's sort of the silver lining that we found from this, to be quite frank. It's not something we did for everything before because it was very expensive. Now that we've done it and we've seen the larger group of people that we're able to reach, I think, you know, it's we can say see, see value and keep that going. Um, with that said, I think that you know, we are moving our focus to as soon as we can back to in-person um, because frankly, I feel like a lot of, and this kind of goes back to just these, this, this sort of idea of, of different kinds of mentorship that can happen anywhere at any time. Mm -hmm. Like so many things that can happen on site, in person, in an event, connections you can make, conversations you can have that lead to other things. Um, I think everyone's feeling uh, missing, you know, missing that a lot. Um, but absolutely, we will be keeping a virtual component. Yeah. One of the earlier comments today was, you know, what the mentor, you know, what are the motivators and having fun has been seen, you know, and the events has been highlighted in the chat as one of the areas that yeah. people have fun. And well, like can, can, I, can I, oh, yeah. Go can ahead. I ask a very, yeah. quick, very quick question? So, um, do you have any idea what is the proportion of participants who pay from their own pocket and not from their company's pockets? Um, it's a great question. I do not have those stats right in front of me that we have, uh, we do, we can pull those and I actually can share them afterwards. Um, not for every event, but for example, KubeCon, they have a professional, I think like a professional registration fee and then a hobbyist registration fee. So you pay less if you're paying out of your own pocket. We ourselves have the same thing across a lot of the Linux Foundation events too. So it's not going to be exact, but it's going to be rough. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, though, we tend to have the majority of people attend events where their company is paying for it, not the individual. But we also have a registration scholarship that basically says if you need a free pass to attend, we will give you one. So, you know, we're trying yeah. to make sure that the financial part is not a limitation for anyone. Um, and, and the reason I was asking that is because I think that there are two different kinds of incentives, one for the company to send their employees to the event, and then for the people who are on their own, they're trying to become parts of the community um, to join, right? Yeah. Well, and, and you bring up an interesting one, just going, kind of going back to this in-person virtual, one of the interesting <laughs> statistics that we saw in the virtual was you know, in the beginning when everything pivoted last year, you know, people were like, okay, we're going virtual, this is happening. Once we started going into not an event pivoted virtual, but we know this event's gonna be virtual, the number of speaking submissions across the board dropped substantially for every event. The same incentive is not there. What a, what a speaker, I mean, you put a lot of time and effort into prepping for a talk, right? Um, and the same incentives aren't there. For you um virtually in my opinion that's what we're seeing a lot of. yeah um you know the fruits of your labor aren't aren't there in the same way so yeah i, I think that um because I, I think you have a 
you have a very interesting uh, natural experiment by the shift because um, I suspect being myself one of those speakers is a lot of speakers contribute to the event, physical event, because they get the travel from the company yep. to go to it. So it's a very, very strong incentive, right? Well, doing it online it changes completely that. I think that is a, a huge point. I mean, I'll, my company's only going to fund me if I'm speaking. We see this that's a lot. Right. So I'm going to speak, then I get to go. And when that's gone, yeah, the submissions have dropped. Okay, I think we're sort of uh, running out and we finally want to do the wrap up. So I'm probably going to turn this over to Shua, but thank you again, Angela, for pulling this together thanks. and letting us thank see you. this perspective. Shua, uh, you want to take presenter? Yes. Okay, I'll let you queue up your, I'll let you queue up the wrap up slides. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Um, just to, uh, to continue the discussion for a little bit and see um, to get more ideas um, and, and have questions in. Uh, let me see the next slide. Okay. Oh. I'm on the wrap up, right? There is one more slide, I think. All right, um, so let's go ahead um, and discuss a couple of ideas that I was thinking was, um, so we have talked about mentoring and mentorships and ideas are like continue uh, to do implicit and explicit mentoring. And uh, some of the things that uh, I've been hearing in, during the conversation that uh, enlisting mentors to share their knowledge more and maybe incentivizing mentorship and recognition, recognizing mentors so that the uh, mentorship in itself is mentoring in itself is a rewarding experience for a lot of people. And how do we make, uh, how do we show our gratitude uh, to, for people taking the time to mentor? Uh, and then also companies to promote and uh, up, up participation. A lot of the mentees, and then new developers say that once they completed their mentorships, they do get jobs right away, but they do not have um, the, either the encouragement or opportunities to continue to uh, contribute upstream. We're hearing that too, right? It has to be a paid, um, I mean, you are nine to five job, more, more, so to speak. It has to be part of your official responsibilities. And then, uh, how do we focus on um, one of the things that resonated with me when I was listening to the keynote uh, a couple a few days ago, John Marta Cahal saying that uh, building communities, building teams um, is as important as building code because we are all getting older. That's part of my motivation, trying to bring new developers into the kernel community. So how do we focus on building communities? At this point, I'll just open it up for a discussion. Um, and just uh, unmute, um, talk. Yeah, and I'm just, uh, Shu, I'm just uploading a fresh version for you there, which has okay. more things out the notes I was catching as we were going along. So um, let me just quickly go in. So these were some of the th things I've caught, but I don't know if I've got all of them. I'm sure I don't have all of them. And then just to refresh, um, you know, what we're going to try to do is see if we can get some of these ideas classified into things we can actually make actionable this year and check. But I will give you control back now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I mean, uh, so some of the things I think I, I kind of talked to some of them. Um, so one is uh, come up with a template. Anita, um, yes, you, you mentioned that uh, maybe having a, a checklist for uh, code um, reviews or checklist for uh, how to submit patches and so on, that might be helpful in addition to the documentation we already have. Um, I think Anita, Anita was mentioning another thing. I think she said um, uh, how to review code. Uh, that might be helpful. And I think another suggestion that came out is, can we train, um, have a mentorship 
uh, maintain a role training for people, for um, experienced contributors and so on. Let me see. Let me uh, read what we have here. That's what I remember. Connect folks into common and regional cohorts of new contributors. Uh, make bot language more sensitive to regional perceptions. So this is with, in regards to how do we respond to patches link? Applied things might not be uh, looked at as uh, polite in some countries or not insufficient. Better collection of first issues for new contributors. So yes, this came up in our previous discussion, I think when Bianca was uh, talk, uh, doing the presentation a few days ago. Yes, uh, some maintainers are very good about um, maintaining a list online and in a place where they have a to-do list. Um, and that would be maybe, that is a, uh, a simple thing that probably it's like a, uh, least time commitment uh, thing that maybe we can encourage maintainers to do and even contributors and then experts in the field. Upstreaming of more of the overview information, examples from chats, signal delivery, device tree, okay. Um, that goes back to maintaining the to-do list and then um, helping uh, subsystems so that's one thing I am looking to do. There are two things I'm looking to do for webinars, LF Live webinars next year. One is if people can come and talk about subsystem expertise. And I have Paul McKinney coming and talking about RCU. He's doing two different webinars, um, one later on this year and then one next year. So I'm kind of looking to get subsystem expertise um, to see if they can share. That's, that's for Kernel, for sure. Uh, modern patch submission subsystems can have, okay, okay, somebody said that they have a uh, patch checking, pre-submit checks internally that they go through. That does help. I have seen it happen in other companies as well when I was working um, in other places that they will uh, review patches internally. So that kind of, a, it is a mentoring, internal mentoring, but that does the help. Um, help new developers go, okay, this patch is, at least they have the confidence to send it out on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. Document uh, baseline best practices for maintaining, yes. Uh, so uh, we, we can, in addition to that, maybe we could also, uh, coupled with this, um, webinars might be able to help. So I'm kind of focusing on that right now. I'll, I'll have to build that out and please reach out to me um, and help me with that effort next year for sure. So we can probably, that might help um, alleviate some of the maintainer, um, the burnout or, you know, not having cycles and that kind of thing. At least even if we can bring the reviewers in and say what reviewers uh, should look for, for a to assist a maintainer in that. Um, so. I'm also, um, I, need to, I, need to, I need to basically put into the chat, uh, train the trainers. I forgot to catch that one in there. Mm -hmm. um, basically, they come up with training. Training, um, right. Or, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, the other motivation that drives women co uh, analysis is making different impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is that, that's all that we do have any? Uh, there, there was more there, but I, I was trying to take okay. notes and try to catch it. Uh, that's all right. Things. No, this is good. This is good list, Kate. Uh, thank you for doing this. I think this makes it, okay. So goals. <laughs> okay. And but anyhow. So by increasing pool of diverse contributors, we want to increase. Yes, um, that is there. And the maintainers. Sure, sure. I'm Kate. Sorry, this is Anita. Yeah. Can I just add, can I just do two things on the previous previous slide uh, that uh, Kate, you captured? I just wanted to highlight two things. Uh, mm -hmm. One is when I was doing interviews with, with uh, regarding mentoring. And a lot of mentors said that they had problem knowing how to mentor, right? How to understand how to give the right feedback, bridging the culture and experience differences, knowing what the motivation is on how to even just interact. So training the trainers would be actually very useful. Just saying what the first steps are, what challenges someone faced and how to overcome it. And um, this, Brain is gone. <laughs> that was another idea. So train the trainer was good. And the other thing I think for improving DEI is how to um, get allies trained. 
So there is this ally workshop that Venera uh, does, which is supposed to be very, very useful. So I think that is one of the things is we are doing a good job with getting awareness, but there are still a lot of allies who are um, people who have seen things, but they don't know how to say anything back or how to respond, what the right vocabulary is to respond. So having some ally, how to be an ally workshop would actually get a lot more people um, helping with the DEI situation, I think. <clears throat> if, if, I, if I can also add, so um, I think that one aspect that has a huge influence is that a lot of developers don't have agency. They are agents of their employer. So I think that understanding the employers, their motivations, their goals, and how they can be influenced to increase diversity is probably key uh, to be able to solve the problem. Uh, many developers will do whatever their employer tells them to do. Uh, they're motivated by uh, what their manager internally tells them uh, is the metric of success. So I think that changing that perspective is um, very important. Well, understanding the, the, the point of view of the employer. So that, uh, I mean, the, the me we get what we measure, right? The results are what we measure. So you're saying, Daniel, that we have to influence the companies uh, in uh, looking for, uh, refine the ways to measure. I would even be stronger and say that the key to increase diversity is not inside with the developers, but with the agents of the kernel. The agents of the kernel are not the individual developers who are paid to do the work. The agents of the kernel are the employers who are the ones who decide in which direction want to go. They are the ones who are going to hire the next person to take to, uh, to contribute to the kernel. They're the ones who can decide whether it's, it's a woman or it's a man or a non-binary person uh, to, uh, that will be put to do that work. Uh, they, 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 <clears throat> these agents, these companies are the ones who decide who will be given time to be maintainer and take the role of maintainership. They will decide who will become a, a mentor. I think that the key really is with the agents of the kernel. And those are mostly the companies that uh, contribute to the kernel. And I also think that the fundamental problem that we have is that we might have the best party around in the neighborhood and advertise it as such, but people might still want to go to a different party in the neighborhood. They might never want to cross the threshold. So a lot of these actions are for the people who cross the threshold, but many people are not crossing the threshold. So the challenge is how to reach the people who are outside. Okay. So any thoughts on how, um, Daniel, do you have any? Um, yeah, so we've been discussing this with Kate a lot, and I think that one of them will be, uh, for example, with the, in terms of newcomers. So to say, look, there are these jobs for kernel developers from these companies. These are positions that need to be filled. We need people to fill them shows that you can do the work so they can have an incentive to join and be productive and show how good they are because they know that there's going to be a reward at the end of the of, of this testing period and uh, <clears throat> so i think that that so there's also a, a way to uh, reward somehow and the same way that you talk about putting badges in people it's as important to put badges in the companies this is the company that is contributing the largest proportion of women to the kernel these days. And uh, because uh, mm. um, in many cases, uh, <laughs> the developers don't have control over that, right? Yeah. Uh, so all, all I'm saying is that many people who are contributors do not make the decisions. And they will, they, they, uh, and we see that in, in the chat that they say, I only work during the work hours. Uh, uh, as long as I get paid by my employer, I will do that work. So uh, the manager is the, their, their manager is the one that determines their actions, right? So they don't have agents, pure agency. They have a little bit of agency because they can make decisions, but in the, in, in the level that we want, they don't have that agency. Well, I think. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time right now because the keynote is about to start, but um, there's been some awesome comments in the chat and I would encourage people to keep using the chat and keep the discussion going there.
And I guess on behalf of uh, Shu and myself, Shu, do you want? Oh, thank you. I guess this no, is thank you, thank you, thank saying. you, everybody. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for a very engaged <laughs> and interesting discussion. Um, and hopefully, we've got some ideas we can try to apply. Um, and, um, and thanks all the speakers um, for coming and speaking about your research and and Angela talking about you the events and Bianca doing all the hard, hard work analyzing the data. Thank you. We have to save the notes, uh, Kate. So I'm kind of hanging in there to see. Yep. Yep. I'm I'm going to do the notes. Okay. Uh, um, I'm going to quick, reach out and get the chat pulled quick too. Question: Like, would you be sharing this notes, or should I copy from the make, text? Make, make your own copy. So the way to make a copy of the notes, because that way, if 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 if, if you're expecting, like I say, it's going to be you know catch up. So there's a uh -huh. the two way arrow at the top. Oh, okay. Above the shared notes. See that little symbol uh -huh. at the right. Click on that. It gives you the formats you can export it into. Nice. That's very nice. Thank you. Okay, Kate Shua, would you guys mm -hmm. mind putting in links to uh, the researchers' homepages in the notes so that we can easily access it? How, how about oh, we ask the researchers that they're not, they're not, they're, they're, they're yeah, not. They, you could, you could just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you could just do it also. Uh, you have access to it. Uh, and and I think, I think every, all the slides of the presentations are there and the researchers have put their contact information into the slides. And into their presentation, so it's there as well. <laughs> Translation. <laughs> yeah. 